New Zealand and a guest. Uh, Amara is over there walking around and will assist you. It's very important that you know uh, and acknowledge everyone who's here. And I think the same goes for all of the presenters and officials today. I am incredibly excited today in some ways to be chairing this meeting because yesterday in council after a long process uh, and, and Fiona will uh, tell you that she was very frustrated with me and others at some times, we have uh, been able to make amendments to the terms of reference to this committee which uh, tomorrow's uh, this May, the committee now has an even longer name, which is the Mayor's Advisory Committee, Water Quality in Wetlands, Waterways and the Coastal Environment. This is primarily to onboard the functions of the Permit Advisory Forum uh, for the Marine Outfalls, which I'll talk a little bit more, but is also an endorsement of the work that we have been doing in water governance in the city of Cape Town in the last two and a half years. When I was, I'll share a small anecdote, when I was helping the mayor on his campaign, he had seven priorities and one of them was clean up Cape Town's waterways. And I am actually before a politician artist. Uh, so I come with a little bit of experience in environmental management and I said to the mayor, oh, this seems like too tough a job to do. And uh, anyway, we made the commitment and desired the mayor's program and have made significant progress in terms of protecting our water aquatic environments, whether it's the coastline or rivers and flays from pollution ingress and we have made significant reforms around how we govern environmental waters in a growing city as well. And you don't have to believe me, you can only look at some of the significant data that has come out from the proactive uh, maintenance and pipe repairs we've seen significant reductions in sewage pools. We have kept open, and uh, some people who aren't here today uh, will, will try and uh, challenge me on this. 2023 was the first year where all of the recreational water bodies in the city of Cape Town were open for 365 out of 365 days. Open and safe for use for the first time in many years. Something that we as Cape Townians can all be proud of. But all of this progress aside, and all of the uh, governance mechanisms which take up a significant amount of time on the officials and also this team of advisors over here. All of these things aside, there's still a lot more to do. And that is why we can also cast as the city of Cape Town uh, our vision onto the horizon of what needs to be happening into the future. And in that note, we have been able to onboard and begin the process of looking at how we can significantly uh, upgrade and change the situation around uh, marine outfalls. We have received a very, very uh, comprehensive report on infrastructure options uh, in the short and long term around that. Uh, and we have also set up, through the Section 80 Committee, uh, the ability to conduct what I like to call scientific oversight. Now, as a politician, uh, I don't think that we, uh, my, my, my peers should be the ones that should be making scientific judgments around a whole variety of things. There are people that are far more qualified to do so. And halfway through our term, I would just like to thank this team of people over here, uh, water activists, specialists, ecologists, professors, doctors. I'd like to thank all of you for your ongoing uh, participation in this committee. Uh, 
some of you are even apologize to me for nagging all the time. I don't think it's nagging. I think that everything that you guys have been able to input in these committee meetings, and more importantly between the committee meetings, has tangibly changed the quality of water governance in Cape Town. I regularly speak to colleagues in Johannesburg, in Durban, in Pretoria, where their governments are unable to deal or even get their hands around their uh, very, very pertinent water quality challenges. And the mechanism that we're establishing here in Cape Town uh, will allow other governments across South Africa to learn how to better onboard scientific advice, conduct scientific oversight, and lean on the best, brightest, and most active people in their water communities. I'd like to thank you for the precedent that you all set. Over and above that, the core outcome of today's meeting is to today receive the first compliance report on the three marine outfalls that are licensed to operate in the city of Cape Town today. Now, no, I think I can say unequivocally that working in wastewater is not a fun business. That it is a dirty reality everywhere. I acknowledge that. Uh, I spent enough time at these wastewater treatment plants to see firsthand for myself how messy it can be. Uh, and this is the environment impact of all of us who have, or even don't have, toilets. The three marine R falls in the city of Cape Town are not ideal, but they do need to be managed scientifically and managed based on data. And so the officials to my left have been under an immense amount of pressure the last few months to up the game on how we govern and measure the outputs and compliance of these marine outputs. We've been engaging extensively with the department of uh, DFFE, who have been uh, working with us on these permit conditions. And Today marks a very important moment in corporate governments uh, around these marine outfalls and how they impact the coastal environment. So today on the first of bit of this meeting, we will be receiving a presentation from Director Killick on the requirements for reporting uh, and what we need to share with the public and get the public's feedback on in terms of what's happening at those marine outfalls. These meetings, by the way, will be happening quarterly. Uh, and then we'll be receiving a presentation on the monitoring, uh, the environmental monitoring plan uh, on the flip side of these uh, from our coastal management team uh, and our consultants, Mr. Rose and Mr. Lissa. So, I'd just like to say one more thing about how I will be chairing this meeting. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that all of the, uh, all of the residents that are here are here. Uh, your participation is incredibly important and necessary today. So I will be in the comment section uh, encouraging you to please ask your questions and clarity uh, together with the councillors and Section 80 committee members here. Uh, and once we have gone through the, uh, this element of the meeting, we will then be moving on to what is a second agenda, and you are all most welcome to step. So for the reporting requirements, we are essentially keeping two separate sets of minutes for the meeting today. The first will be around the Marine Art Force, and uh, obviously all of your participation will be uh, recorded in that. That will then be circulated and sent to the National Department as the Permit Authority. Uh, and then after that, we'll be moving into some more fun things around uh, sort of the general things that this committee has been tracking. 
And I would love you guys to stay for that because we have some exciting items on that agenda. Uh, otherwise, uh, are there any questions at this point? Caroline. So thank you, Alex, for your kind words, and I think having coastal waters included in the Section 80 committee is really important, so thank you for that. Just for clarity, Wilmington Canoe Club has been closed for the last three years because of water quality concerns, so presumably water lagoon, because Wilmington Lagoon is a water body because it's not a beach, it's a recreational water body, and yet it has been closed for three years. It's not a beach, so I just want clarity. Is it a recreational water body or not? Well, you, 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 will, you will know better than me on, on some of the aspects around Wilton Lagoon that uh, the lagoon is, uh, is part of our, what I would consider our ecological infrastructure uh, in Cape Town and uh, and in that water body. Uh, and you also know, as a resident there, that it's permanently closed. So, uh, yeah, my point is that some recreational water bodies aren't closed, Northern Lagoon being one of them. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, uh, a small note before I hand over to Director Killick is that uh, if you do want to speak, there's a little button on, on the thing and uh, the light should light up red. Uh, please use the mic because we do have people participating virtually. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I'll now hand over to Director Kelly. Thanks very much, Chair, um, and good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So the presentation which I'm going to cover today is uh, just the reporting requirements uh, in terms of uh, the permit which we received from uh, DFFE. So just to say that DFFE have, uh, has accepted in principle that the BAF can be incorporated into the Section 80 Committee. We have amended the terms of reference and we submitted these to uh, DFFE. In fact, they made suggestions to us what to include in the, um, in the um, uh, revised terms of reference. And this was approved by Council on the 25th of April, which was yesterday. So the forum must comprise a permit holder, interested and affected parties and relevant government institutions. And the city has decided to have one forum for all three of the, of, of the, of the outfalls. So today I'm going to just go through the permit conditions. In other words, this is what we, what we need to comply with. Um, the monitoring and reporting requirements and then just some general effluent issues. So in terms of the permit conditions, there are nine sections in, in, in the permit. Section A deals with the decision. Section B deals with uh, the permit holder details. Uh, section C, the activity details. Section D, the description of the process, location, site, and discharge point. Section E is general conditions. Section F is the specific conditions. So these are the ones which we are interested in and which we will be reporting on. Section 9 deals with appeals. Section 8, the reasons for decision. And then section I, the claim. So under section F, which is the specific conditions, it talks about effluent quality, uh, quantity, it speaks about effluent quality. And those are the two main items which we're going to be focusing on today. It speaks about what the monitoring requirements are, and you'll find that the presentation, well, actually three and four, monitoring and environmental monitoring, will be covered by the second presentation today. Um, analysis of samples, pipeline integrity and condition, malfunctions and abnormal conditions, contingency plans, reporting requirements, any investigations which are required, so if there's um, a problem with the, with the water quality, uh, DFFE may require that we undertake further investigations. Uh, decommissioning, compliance review committee, and then permit validity. 
So if we can just touch briefly on each of the specific conditions, the effluent quantity, that refers to flows, and there it will be a uh, quarterly submission, which we just make to uh, DFFE. The effluent quality, that consists of, it's more of a chemical analysis, it consists of pH, COD, TSS, TKN, ammonia, and metals, and it gives an upper limit which may not be exceeded, and that is also a uh, quarterly submission. And the permit requirements have actually got different requirements for the marine outfall. Some are monthly, softly, and some are weekly, is that correct? So, yeah, the, 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 the permit conditions vary. There's one about monitoring, so in other words, date, time, method of sampling and analysis, environmental monitoring, a monitoring plan program must be submitted to DFFE, and currently um, Infinity are um, uh, performing this function. So that's going to be the next presentation. Monitoring points, locations of receiving water environment to be approved by DFFE, so that's also something which will be covered. And then analysis of the, of the sample must be done in accordance with um, uh, the um, uh, Bureau of the uh, SAN standards. And any change in methods must be reported to DFFE and approval of time prior. Pipeline integrity and condition. We must conduct a survey every three years. The survey must assist in detecting the mechanical failures, full length of the marine outfall pipeline and associated structures, ocean bed directly below the marine outfall pipeline and integrity of the pipeline. So we actually do have an existing tender on that. And we conducted this assessment, I think it was in May, June last year. Um, and what that survey found was that the integrity of, the, of all three marine outfall pipelines was in good order. It did refer to the Hout Bay one and I think said that some of the um, uh, dispersion points were blocked. But they're actually not blocked, they've been closed. And the reason why they've been closed is because of the low flows. So the more dispersion points you have, it's not going to um, you know, behave like it should. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a blocked uh, dispersion point. And then eight, uh, malfunctions, abnormal conditions. Accurate and up-to-date records must be kept, and the records must not be limited to the following. Any operating errors, mechanical failures, environmental factors, floods and storms, loss of supply services, e.g. power failure. So we do have generators at all of our marine outfalls. Um, other causes and undetermined. So if that occurs, we need to report that to uh, the FFE. Then the contingency plan, which is a wastewater risk abatement plan, and that must contain standard operating procedures, staff list, plan maintenance, standby personnel, stock lists, emergency standby power facilities, emergency standby pumps, provision for sufficient storage capacity to cope with the normal or abnormal typical loads, schedule of monitoring, and mitigation measures for exceeding permit conditions, and then a wastewater incident protocol. So that is a document which we need, and we have to update that and submit it to DFFE. And then the reporting requirements. Obviously, we must form this permit advisory committee. We need to submit quarterly reports, which consists of flow, incidences, and minutes of this meeting, and any results and findings from the monitoring program. So that's what we need to submit on a quarterly basis. Report on marine impact assessment, Incidents and monitoring trends to be submitted three months after the SMS assessment completion, and then a report detailing the results of the independent audit monitoring to be submitted by Andy. And we took an independent audit monitoring in April this year, and I will give you the results of that. And then a uh, report and, and uh, present to the Compliance Review Committee. And then point 11 is investigation, methods of for improvement of effluent quality compliance. So what we do is we submit our um, quarterly report, and if there is non-compliance, the FFE may come back to us and say, can you please submit another report to show how you're going to improve on certain aspects. Means of optimizing dispersion at sea and minimizing, and then additions, upgrades to the systems currently being utilized on site. And then if there's any decommissioning, the department must be informed one year prior to the decommissioning. And then the FFE also have a role. They need to um, uh, institute a compliance review committee. 
So this must consist of authorities determined by the department. So the FFE will determine who is on that compliance review committee. A uh, committee will convene when necessary to review the status of compliance. Committee may recommend amending, revoking, or suspending the permit. May invite any specialist or technical experts to, to participate in the review processes and committee meetings and to make recommendations on prohibiting or continuing. Then the permit validity. The permit validity for Camps Bay is for five years and for Greenpoint and Hout Bay is issued for ten years. Permit holder must submit an implement, uh, must submit an effluent improvement plan, that depending upon the results which come out of the compliance audit, uh, must conduct a dispersion modeling exercise, and must submit a renewal application at least six months before the expiry of the, of the permit. So those are the conditions which we need to uh, comply with uh, as part of the permit condition. And you know, as part of the of the PAF. You know, if we do a structural integrity of the pipeline and we do that survey, we will then ultimately, if there are findings on that, we will report on that to this, to this committee. So just to speak a little bit about the flows, um, what is shown on this graph, and I've just shown it for the last five to six months, is the flows out of each of the marine outfits. So you can see the first slide shows uh, the flows out of Greenpoint. Um, you'll see that there's a jump in round about February. I did query this, and this was a uh, metering issue, which we uh, had to calibrate the meters again, and we are going to be reporting that to DFFE. But on the next slide, I just show the previous year, just to show you, um, just to give you a longer, a longer record. The green line represents the DFFE permit which we received. And uh, that permit um, condition gave us a 25 megalitres per day average dry weather flow. Um, so that's average over the year. Um, and then also just to note that the design capacity of the outfall, in other words, that is what the uh, marine environment can assimilate, uh, was 14 megalitres per day. Um, and the license which we received from the national department was 40, just under 45 megalitres per day. So the licenses under which we were operating, prior to the licensing authority becoming DFFE, the license we had was uh, 45 megalitres per day from the from the outfall. I'll speak a bit more about the license, about the um, uh, permit volumes later. So this just shows Greenpoint. I think that that spike in July could have been a rainfall event, I'm not 100% sure. But that, this is the, the flows over the last year, or actually two years, coming out of Greenpoint. And you can see that is well below the 25 megalitres per day average from that flow. Uh, for Camps Bay, um, the DFFE permit condition is over 11 megalitres per day. So we suspect there may have been some confusion between Camps Bay and Hout Bay, where the DWAS license was level. So, I mean, one can clearly see that that is not, not correct, the permit condition there. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the design capacity there is uh, 5, and our license from the National Department is around about 5.5. So we are, we are currently, our average annual flow is uh, currently well under that. And then if you look at Hout Bay, um, Hout Bay, um, the National Department license was 11, which is similar to what I showed on the, on the previous slide for Camps Bay. Um, the design capacity is around about 9.5 megalitres per day. Uh, in fact, we requested 9.5 in our permit application, and uh, DFFE gave us an average of uh, 5 megalitres per day. And I think there was some confusion at the time regarding the application we made during the drought for um, the uh, discharge, um, for discharge and drying into the environment. So, I mean, I think that you can see that the volumes and the permits aren't rational, and we welcome the appeal 
so that we can actually address this with DFFV. And we are, we're in the process of writing to DFFV and we are going to be addressing these, these volumes um, and permit uh, volumes for each of the new outfits. Uh, in terms of quarterly reporting, um, we do our own, um, in terms of effluent compliance, we do our own tests at scientific services. So, uh, but DFFE wants an independent laboratory to also conduct the testing. So in between the biannual testing, which an independent laboratory does, we undertake our own monitoring, and uh, this just shows Greenpoint um, what it is in comparison, what the what our test showed in comparison with the permit limits. So the permit limits are shown in red, and uh, the testing which we did, um, it, the results are shown in black uh, for each of the columns. I put a little red star next to the ones which uh, were about the permit conditions. It's just interesting to note that the permit condition from zinc is 0.096. For drinking water, it's 5. So it is, it's actually a bit of an anomaly, and I think that is something which we also need to engage with the uh, with, uh, DFF around. Uh, for CAPS pay, um, generally compliant, you'll see arsenic, the limit is 0.0018, and we were marginally above that, but that, you see it's, for February and March, it's 0.02, so that may also be a rounded figure, we're not 100% sure. And then once again, see. For how Bay, uh, we uh, didn't have the ability internally at the time to test cyanide and mercury, but we tested all of the other requirements in the permit. And for how Bay, since November, I didn't pick up any non-compliance uh, with the permit conditions um, tested by scientific services. So I think, Chair, this presentation will be made available to people afterwards, so you can look at it. Um, in your, in your own time as well. So in terms of non-compliance, as can be seen in the compliance data tables of the marine, of the marine outfalls, most results are within the permit requirements or marginally out of spec, and these have been reported to DFFE in the last two quarterly reports, which we submitted to them. And water pollution control will also be asked to investigate uh, where there is uh, you know, marginal non-compliance. Uh, there may be some institutions dis uh, discharging into our um, sewer system, um, uh, not in accordance with their license conditions. Um, and this, uh, these results are supported by the testing and analysis done by an external independent auditor, which we conducted on the 17th of April, and it shows an average compliance of greater than 97% across all of our marine outfits. That's done by an independent auditor. The debate around the design flow versus daily volume, especially during a rain flow event. So, you know, if you, your, your design capacity is the ability of the marine environment to absorb effluent, then you must correct me if I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrong, Greg. If there is stormwater discharge with it, it actually dilutes it. So they allow a greater uh, volume. Um, in, in terms of that. Um, so we're going to be discussing the uh, permit uh, flows with uh, DFFD. At Greenpoint for the, December, for the period December 23 and February 24, there was an issue with the flow meter and recalibrated and now shows fly, flow lines um, consistent with the two previous years. And then outside of the reporting period, which was just taken as six months, there was a malfunction of the duty pump while other pumps were in for repairs at Camps Bay. This led to a flooding of the pump station on the 4th of February 2022. The pump station was restored to full operation on the afternoon of the 5th of February, and this incident was reported to the department. So I'm sure you, some of you are aware of that, of that incident. And another incident which occurred, uh, there was a fire at uh, Camps, Bay, well, yeah, uh, Camps Bay Marine Outfall. Uh, this is, incident was not reported as part of the quarterly report which we submitted because it had no impact on the effluent compliance, but uh, we are reporting it now. So it's just for information to the FFE. And I can just show you some pictures 
the fire started outside. Um, I think that there were some homeless people sleeping outside the uh, outside the marine outfall. It got into the one vent and spread through the uh, through the Hart Bay pump station. Uh, through the Camps Bay pump station. So we are busy with restoration work at the moment. Um, we were able to claim from insurance for that. So these are the audit findings, and uh, you can look at it uh, in your own time when we circulate the presentation. But for Greenpoint, we got 100% compliance, and this was done by the independent auditor. For Camps Bay, we got 91.7% compliance, and the reason why it wasn't uh, 100% was because um, they couldn't test down to that limit for uh, Austin. So they, they went to the margin of what they could of what they could test. So that's why they said there, you know, there was uh, an inquiry. And then for Health Bay, in terms of um, all of the all of the parameters which we had to test, we were 100 percent compliant with the permit conditions. And then the, these are the results of the uh, of the independent audit. The compliance work focuses on the requirements of the DFFE non-compliance notice uh, for the Hart Bay, Camps Bay and Greenpoint. The audit findings is that the three treatment facilities are compliant with all parameters, with the exception of Austin for the Camps Bay wastewater treatment plant. Whilst the audit report reports it as a negative finding, it must be considered that the report value is the minimum detection value that a accredited laboratory may officially report. It is possible that the value is less than the discharge limit. It is recommended that this test be repeated to confirm the results and then be addressed by a risk mitigation measure potentially directed at the point source of cost. So that was the uh, that was the finding from the from the compliance audit. So that is the that is the feedback and that is the um, report which we will be also submitting to uh, DFFE as part of our quarterly reporting. And of course. Uh, any comments which you have um, on this, um, we can merge them or they can chair. I would, I would suggest if there are comments, they also can be submitted within a certain time frame. Um, and we can also um, inform the DFFE. So we're happy to address any, any questions. Thank you so much, Director Kivik, for the comprehensive <coughs> presentation. I know that through our engagements over the course of this week, you guys have put a lot of effort into this report today. Before I open to questions, I am going to ask you uh, and Mr. Melissa to restate uh, or define uh, design capacity as far as it pertains to these wastewater treatment plants. Uh, Mr. Moxley um, has been bugging me a lot about this, uh, and I know that this is uh, something that he is personally very interested in and uh, has drawn to my attention. So uh, I would like you guys to, uh, to just comment on that one more, one more time. Uh, and then the second thing is, can you please go to the, uh, the slide of the graphs in the shop? Which, which, um, the one of the limits, the overall ones. They're free though. Oh, okay. yeah, well, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, so, to, just, to, just to clarify for the minutes as well, that uh, the previous permit authority was DWS, that's and right. the benefits also indicated there. The current permitting authority, which we're operating under now, <coughs> is DFE, and that's slightly. That's right. And that that's right. That's, that's right. right. That's right. right. Cool, cool, cool. That's, that's, that's all, I, all I want to know. Would you like to take questions in series of three? Or? Well, I, I think we can address your question about the design capacity. I'm going to ask Greg if he can do it because you'll be a lot more helpful. It's got a very poetic explanation. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Jess. So, uh, Jeremy's going to cover it again as well in his presentation around the monitoring plan. But our understanding of the design capacity is that for each location, the design capacity, when the articles were designed and modeled and paired in terms of the length of the pipe and where they discharge is, like, uh, is directly related to that is the maximum amount of uh, domestic wastewater treatment.
treatment if in the that environment can assimilate on our behalf or on behalf of the people of Cape Town before they are deleterious from term and significant environment. So those limits are set at Greenpoint at 40 megaliters per day, at Camps Valley it's around 5 megaliters per day, and Hard Bay 9.8 megaliters per day. In, the theory is that if you exceed those levels of wastewater effluent discharge through the articles, you will begin to see the leakage and significant environmental impacts resulting, um, as well as impacts on shoreline recreational use of the coastline. So the design criteria was what is the maximum amount of wastewater effluent that you can discharge that the environment can assimilate before you uh, exceed the capacity of the environment to assimilate on our behalf. And that is also to be clear, not no pollution, that is uh, where it changes from being able to assimilate pollution to where it becomes significant and deleterious long term impacts. Uh, so that's our understanding of the design capacity. So, uh, Greg, if you could also just comment on the wet weather. So, if there's. Yes, yeah, so, so part of um, uh, the reason for the, the design capacity is obviously not to exceed the environmental capacity to assimilate wastewater on our behalf. That is how the engineers, when they design these articles, uh, took those designs. But obviously, during wet weather conditions, there's a significant amount of intrusion of fresh water through stormwater and various other sources into the sewer as a whole within Cape Town as the city. Um, and so when we have wet weather, you have an increase in the volumes of discharge of marine outfalls, but that's not the same as an increase in volumes of wastewater effluent out the outfalls. That's just an increase in volumes of the total amount of water going out the outfalls. And the contribution to that outfalls is stormwater is managed the way that it should be, and we don't all put our own waste into the stormwater drain, is that it's fresh water being added to the wastewater, which is a diluting factor in terms of how our water are designed, where there's a dilution and assimilation effect of wastewater in the marine environment. Thank you, Mr. Lusa. I see that we do have some additional guests uh, that have arrived a little bit late. Uh, you are very welcome here today. Thank you so much. Please make sure that you sign the attendance register that's floating around here somewhere. Uh, and what we will what we will do now is I will take a series of three questions from the public representatives and committee members, and then once we've taken that three, then I'll open up to to the guests. Uh, okay, questions. Uh, I see Mr. Moxie's number one, number two, Doctor Doctor Day, number three. Winter? Okay, cool. And then, then uh, we'll add you to the next round, Mr. Um, uh, Edward. Committee, thanks very much. I just want to also just um, thank uh, the administration for actually um, you know, arranging this PLA because I think we've had these uh, articles for over 20 years, and I think that this is the first time that uh, there's actually a forum that's going to be monitoring. So I want to thank that and also just recognize the activists that have actually maybe put a little bit of pressure on, this, on the city to do that. So that's the first thing. Um, the capacity uh, I think we're talking about right now, um, it seems to me that the green points and the hydro pipes are, are operating well within the capacity, uh, design capacity, but the Camps Bay, maybe we could just leave that on the, on the slide here, but the Camps Bay one is approaching its limit. And it is probably the, the pipeline that is um, the oldest, certainly it was the one that was built as soon as it was. Um, and I think it's probably approaching its uh, limit. So, you know, just to group all three pipes in one, I think this is quite the right way to approach this. Uh, I, I think that we should specifically look at Camps Bay as a possibly being one that's approaching its limit. Um, Design limit, um, you said it's five and a half megalitres per day. You said it's five, and then uh, the place of license was five point five. Point five, five, point five. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it, yeah, so it's okay, it's, it's actually still quite a long way away from five. I think it also depends, you've got to look at you know, the analysis we need to do. What is the potential for growth in the area? Long term, spatially. And I think for Camps Bay, maybe it won't be as much as potentially Hub Bay or something like that. I think that's a particular part that we need to keep an eye on. Um, so, if I may just um, also 
I was interested to see that uh, you have noted that there are some discrepancies in the permit. Uh, possibly they've got the outlay and the case that they mixed up. But it also it just comes to my attention that the actual um, criteria are different for each pipe. So if you, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the actual criteria of the monitoring of the effort, there's a different amount. So yeah. For example, zinc um, in the Camps Bay pipeline is, is 0 0.135. And zinc isn't even mentioned in our yeah. data. And it's, and it's 0 0.096 in the input. So I think it's a good idea, and, and this is great that the forum will be able to report back to the um, to actually, I would suggest getting these things all in the line. So I don't see why one pipeline should be treated differently to another. The green environment is the same, unless I'm um, mistaken. So that would be something I think to take that back to you. Um, one thing that you didn't show us is, is uh, what needs to be uh, monitored is the suspended solids. And I think um, from a public point of view, um, Suspended solids is what we notice most. And sometimes litter and other stuff that seems to go out of the pipelines and possibly that's because of the of screens, etc. Um, so I think that that needs to be monitored. So, so I mean, I think TSS, but TSS as for the sands is, is done, I think we were speaking more well, coarser. Yeah, yeah we, got, we, we are finding. Uh, all sorts of things coming out of the pipeline. For example, down the river, the public's also reporting stuff that might not be coming from the pipeline. And I think it would be worth actually keeping an eye on the screening because uh, that is what the public is seeing and it's obviously detrimental to the environment if it's not the So that just brings me to um, a media release which I saw, which was published yesterday for the budgets uh, for various uh, pump stations and service works around the uh, Cape Town. We didn't see anything for the pipelines. Um, there was a hundred million that was recommended by the consultants. I don't remember the uh, uh, for sorry, um, for which should, should be done immediately. Um, is we don't know what they uh, suggest it needs to be done so that is, I think they think they indicate it's going to be possible to be 40. Is that correct? 140. Um, uh, the 100 currently is on our is on our budget, and I think we have already commenced with the uh, tender. So you know we are happy to bring more information on that uh, to this committee. Um, what is exactly what the scope of the term? We've got a concern about the work for Yeah, sorry, so the $140 billion relates to refurb, replacement and refurb of equipment in the pump station itself, not necessarily the power pump. Screening. Part, that's part of the pump station. Oh yeah, the talk today was the same. Thanks, Mike. I just got a quick question around the actual municipality management itself. Um, and first, a comment is on the issue around the permitting variables and how they differ between the pump stations. Just something to bear in mind is that loading is also important. To load. Yeah, so that if you've got different volumes coming out and the concentrations if the concentrations are the same, your load impact might be different. But my question was around the monitoring requirements themselves. And I wasn't sure, are you monitoring monthly for the water quality parameters? So the permits also have different requirements for the outfalls in terms of in terms of how often we need to monitor as well. Um, and I think we do monitor for scientific services monitor. They do frequently. So the previous permits were required weekly, and the, the new issued permits for the Cambridge Green Point had changed to monthly. 
and how they fill in the detail. So it's, it is different depending upon the terms. So, so my question then would be with, with your independence evaluation. Um, does that take place in parallel with citing services monitoring? And if not, I think it would be a useful thing to do so that you're getting a comparative. So we, so we do um, test continuously with, with like scientific services, so we can. I don't know if they take the tests at the same time. That is something which we, which we could request. I think that would be a useful thing if it gives us a, sort of a free additional yeah. check. Thanks. Dr. Nizzo. Thank you very much. And I think just to, um, uh, part of my question has been answered by Paul Moxley's questions around the, um, the permitting. I think that um, DEF, I don't know how responsive they are to uh, accumulations and to understanding by accumulations in the art letter as well, in the art form, and, and therefore these permits need to be uh, progressive in the way in which they are applied. And it would be good for the city to be uh, going a little further. And the concerns around our fall, among other things, have been in drugs, pharmaceuticals, microplastics, and we need to make sure that those are measured. There may not be permanent requirements, but they should be in terms of DEF's um, uh, approach and a progressive approach to try to deal with that. And then the last very obvious thing that's sitting up on that column on the right-hand side there for domestic waste to be releasing lead, zinc, arsenic, there's some real problems there. And there are, there are elements that are coming into that um, that should not be part of domestic waste. And we've got to get a grip on that. That's just unacceptable. And I'll ask Greg, you're going to be dealing with that um, issue in your presentation, the first issue raised by Dr. Greg. Uh, yeah, we, we cover that in the environment market. Okay. Uh, for the next round of questions, uh, I'll switch over to our guests. Can I please request that you state your full name and if you are associated to a group body or institution, uh, please also state that for the record. Uh, so I think I've got two questions so far. I think uh, Prof. Petrick, is there anyone here? No? Okay, cool. And then this gentleman over there. Yeah. Where? Okay, cool. Uh, and then, and then the lady at the back. Okay, then you can be on the floor. Okay. Uh, Man? Perfect. Uh, morning, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I firstly want to hear from your mouth that the permits have now been issued by the Department of Environmental Affairs. Is this correct? Uh, because it's not clear to me because we had a public participation process that was supposed to have been taken into account before the permits were issued. So, um, the, the, the permit was issued for Hout Bay in 2019 and the two permits were issued for Greenpoint and Camps Bay. I think it was the beginning of last year. So December 22? December 22. Um, those are under, all, of, all three are currently under appeal? Yes. And, and we did an extensive public participation exercise? Yes, but that has not concluded. That has not been concluded, that's still the DFA. Right. Um, next question on this topic is, um, you talk about environmental impact monitoring, and I refer to uh, Professor Kevin Winter's uh, comments. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention my affiliation. I'm an emeritus professor at the University of the Western Cape, and my name is Leslie Petrick, for those of you who don't know me. Um, referring to the bioaccumulation potential of uh, pharmaceuticals and drugs, um, I am concerned that the permit requirements do not mention these, uh, because when we have done studies, we have seen that all the organisms, from muscles, 
to penguins, to fish, are by accumulating our modern medical uh, pharmaceuticals. And the permit requirements do not address that in terms of the environmental impact assessment. And I concur with Kevin Winter that we should be progressive about this. Um, third comment is that uh, I see you talking about uh, modeling of the pollution flows as one point to be establishing the dispersion. Um, you keep talking about the simulative capacity of the environment. Uh, your plume dispersion allows a zone of impact of about 200 meters. But we have found these chemical contaminants up to 20 kilometers away from the outfalls. Robben Island is contaminated. The whole of False Bay is contaminated right down into the deep parts of that bay. And the same thing goes for Caps Bay and Half Bay. So the modeling that you're using is based on instantaneous flows. In other words, you look at the flow as an instant of time, whereas the flow continues 24-7, 365 days a year, ad infinitum. So those flow modelings are completely inaccurate. Thank you. Chair, I think that a lot of that is going to be addressed in Greg's presentation as well. Chair, I, I can respond to some of those if I can while it's um, tabled. Um, I think there are important questions. I think the first thing, if we can, um, to cover is that we agree that uh, chemicals measure concern are major concern, but that's a concern across all of wastewater, not just other marine outfalls. Um, and my understanding is that we are required, in terms of the monetary plan, to monitor chemicals and measuring concern. But globally, there aren't yet standards for determining what levels are acceptable or unacceptable. Until those standards are set, the FFE won't be able to install them within a permit. So there's nobody that knows yet what level of dark panic in a muscle or any of these kind of chemicals is a exceeding a limit that is harmful to the environment. We all agree that they are harmful to the environment, but globally, no one can yet determine what is that level, what is that limit. And so they can't put that in a permit. What they can put in the permit, which they've asked for, is that we monitor the discharge of chemicals of measuring concern uh, as part of the environmental monitoring. But there are no yet any established global levels, um, like there are established global levels for other contaminants. And that's part of the problems around chemicals of measuring concern, is nobody's yet able to determine at what level they become hugely problematic. We can agree and speculate that they are problematic, and our extensive use of chemicals in our lives is problematic. But they still need to establish those levels, and that's a global phenomenon and a glo global thing. In terms of Professor Petrick's um, concern around the fact that you can find these in, Camp uh, in, in False Bay and 20 kilometers away from the R4, these chemicals are coming out of all of the wastewater discharge points, and so they're not coming from just the R4. To claim that the chemicals in False Bay are related to the mean r is not correct. There's, there may be in part, but they're also coming from all of the wastewater treated effluent, which discharges from our rivers and different discharge points. So they are coming out of the Black River, the Salt River, the Dip River. They're coming out of the wastewater treatment effluent plant at Robben Island. They're coming out of the marine outfalls. They're coming out of uh, the Cape Flats wastewater treatment works. They're coming out of everywhere. So they are ubiquitous in our environment now. Um, and so you will find them 20 kilometers uh, away from our coastline. Um, and you'll find them across the coastline, unfortunately. And they are more indicative of our extensive use of resources and the amount of pollution that we produce. So we're in complete agreement around uh, Professor Petrick's concerns, but this is an, an evolving science and something that the, the world has to confront in its own way in terms of how do we use these chemicals in the ways that we do and then to manage them from becoming extremely harmful and impactful on our environment. So I've covered some of those points yet. Uh, thank you, and, and Professor Petrick, uh, I think that we appreciate your engagement on the next item on the agenda as well if there's any follow ups. Uh, back number two, thank you. Chair, I'm glad that, can you hear me? I'm glad that uh, the previous speaker, the Emeritus uh, Professor, mentioned that I'm a local businessman from the uh, business of state. Uh, so I'm in the bathroom company. Sorry, I have picked up. Sorry, I picked up. Yeah, last state your. I'm Andrew from Fearing. 
I'm a local businessman from Fulgrove in the bucking company. I work with water every day. So I'm on that side of the cycle. Now, I've, loved, I've heard a lot of uh, theoretical explanations, which is amicable and it's important, and it's how we measure our environment. Um, I turned a businessman from a scientist myself, so I now on the other side of the cycle. I see it daily. I measure every batch of water that I put through. I generate key water, and from key water I work with folic acid, which is life-saving products for people with all kinds of cancers, etc., etc. I started picking up in the last six months a drop in the uh, parasites in the water, or the, the contamination in the water that we measure. A drop to the city, uh, under a thousand is drinkable. Uh, it was 536, it's now dropped to 636. I started looking at uh, what was going on in the environment, I started scouting around, I met a whistleblower, it took me, and I was the guy that took the samples with Professor Joe Barnes for uh, the strength from tape which we handed over to, to, to some activists and political parties to take further. I'm out there to protect my business. I'm not here to fight with the city. The city has done me good. I actually migrated two years ago from Gauteng. I've invested millions of rands in my plant. And uh, to me, the city and the services that I receive from the city is important because of the products that I produce. These products are research in labs and then we take it to the industrial area where we manufacture them and make it available to people that need them. Okay, so for me, from this side, I appreciate everything that you've done and how you measure, etc. But I want to agree with uh, the professor there is that there is a slide in the quality of services. Maybe it's uh, the, the migration and the number of people that are on the system that are causing the affluent to go into the sea that is picked up. Like we did in, San, uh, in Strandfontein, which Professor Joe Barnes wrote the report and Bill Lab did the test. And I think later in the second meeting that will be exposed and the whole report will be brought to table. I just want to mention that as a businessman, I do care about the environment I'm in. I do support all the work that is done by all the professionals. But uh, I feel it's important that I come here today and report this to you guys is that I'm picking it up. I'm spending thousands and thousands of extra rays putting all kinds of technology to fight the bacteria in the water so that I can generate medical classification care water and from where I then generate my food substances for cells uh, uh, for the body to use. Thank you, sir. So, uh, if I can, just a point of clarity, are you speaking about potable water, which you use in your, in, in your product? Or is it seawater? My plant has been devised for seawater, natural water, rainwater, and city water. I can, I'm not limited to, to city water with extra cost to, to purify it and prepare it as prepared water for bottling, yes. Uh, and I can use uh, underground water which I also have to prepare. Uh, but the point is, uh, if the sea, if all those sources uh, dry up, the sea is there, and I can't use it. Because I found that uh, in the test that we did, together with Professor Joe Barnes, that the contamination in the area where we would be tapping into the seawater and, and desalinization and, and put it through our process is not usable. And that's why I got involved. Uh, where, where is this point that you potentially uh, well, uh, at this stage, uh, it will be released in the next meeting, just after this. I, oh, wait, I'm not a type of the same way. Have you been talking with Paul? Oh, it has already been brought to, okay. to the micro uh, member, which refuted it. Uh, and I think uh, I'll leave it up to uh, Councillor Carl Bowden to, to, make, to make it uh, known. I, I had a long conversation with Carl yesterday afternoon, and yeah, we were on the same thing for us. But yeah, that's our next meeting. Uh, Cool. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, who was the lady in the back? Yeah. Yeah. Good day, my name is Suya Hanakum. I'm here as a member of the public to participate. Um, I would just like to know there's been 
a lot of talk on social media and in circles that I move around of uh, concerns of getting sick and bacterial infections uh, that people contracted after swimming in the water or swimming in the oceans around Cape Town. And I would just like to know how far this problem, how extensive this problem is, if it's been acknowledged and if you, know, you guys have an answer for me. Uh, you'll be great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, about every, uh, every few weeks we publish the water quality testing results along the coast uh, and these regular testing points uh, to indicate that all residents have access to it, the coastal water quality as you are so uh, If there is a even those test results or a pollution incident which we know of, uh, we will go and direct signage on the beach to say that uh, we don't recommend that you swim in that water. Uh, I think uh, maybe Greg can correct me on this, but what differs with the flames and those recreational assets and the lakes and things that we own is we can stop you from accessing that. Uh, I think it's the Coastal Resources Management Act that actually says that we can't stop you from swimming. So um, we, we can't lose that right. Is, is that correct? Yeah, well, sure, we can close areas on a, a short term discrete event, but where there are, and so uh, I can expand a little bit on that, is that the coastline is generic as well. There, there are different points on the coastline that are polluted, and those are generally associated with continual discharges, mostly through, and uh, Caroline will be well aware of this, for example, the Dip River is highly polluted at the moment, and so if, where that discharge is at the shoreline, uh, you will get high bacterial counts, and so we don't recommend swimming close to a river mark in any urban environment, and that would be consistent globally, so there are points of pollution, there are also constant uh, stormwater discharges in some areas where there are legal connections and all sorts of things into the stormwater drain. So essentially in summer, if the stormwater drain is running and it hasn't been raining, you need to be aware that it's essentially there's some form of pollution coming down that stormwater system. And you also get, like we had a big black south Easter last, uh, on the 9th of April, in the beginning of a season like this, you get a big rainfall event, it will flush all of the catchment. So there's a huge amount of gunk and pollution sitting up in the catchments of an urban environment that we have in the city. And we would not recommend swimming close to a river mouth or something after a big flush of a rainfall event like that because it will chuck out a whole lot of pollution. Um, and that would be a common recommendation that you'll find if you go to Australia, California, etc. As that was said to you there as well, don't swim near a river mouth 24 hours after a rainfall event. Um, then we have discrete events that happen on our coastline. So all of our wastewater treatment works, uh, all of the sewage gets pumped, it's gravity fed. So all of the pump stations are right by the coastline. So the sewage all flows down to a pump station and it gets collected there and it gets pumped onto somewhere else. With load shedding, um, the city's caught up with a lot of generators over the last year, but over the last couple of years with load shedding and also with just general failures like you would have in any kind of infrastructure. If there's a failure at a pump station, we'll get a discrete event where there's a pollution discharge into that environment. And an example of that, uh, it, Two Decembers ago, we had to close Delbrook Tidal Pool uh, three times during December because of load shedding and a pump station failure. So there are multiple sources of pollution. So there are discrete events. And then also, if you look at the water quality data that we produce, there are points, which we call monitoring points, where there are continual points of higher pollution. And those are always related uh, close to wastewater treatment effluent discharge points, which are rivers and big stormwater drains. I think the the gentleman over there raised this Dranfantine one, it will come up later, but that is the way that which is paying wastewater treatment discharge point. And so in proximity to something like that, you will have higher bacterial counts. But by and large, um, across all of our, rec what we would recognize as recreational nodes, so places like Clifton Forth, um, using the corner fish hook in front of the gate where people go and swim and recreate, by and large, it's a generalized statement, but by and large, the water quality in Cape Town at those locations is, is good. So there are variables within that, um, and there are discrete events, there are rainfall events, and there are pollution events. But there's a huge spectrum of, of how pollution takes place across the coastline, and it's not a simple, it's a complex problem, and it's mostly because we live in a big urban environment of about four and a half million people, 
We are also the receiving environment for much of the wastewater treatment effluent that is managed and produced in municipalities outside of Cape Town that is discharged into river systems and catchments that come into Cape Town. So Stellenbosch is an example of that and others where the effluent is, tra is, is transported down the river system into Cape Town and comes out onto our coastline. And then there's also a lot of contaminants that come down the catchments as a whole, particularly from agricultural areas that also feed into our catchments. So for example, the Dip River catchment, which comes at Milton, is a massive catchment that goes way into the internet. I think it's my colleagues from Britain, but there's thousands of square kilometers. And so that captures all of the pollutants in that catchment that travels down and that emerges in the Milton Lagoon, the Dip River at, at Lagoon Beach, and then the currents are a certain way, can transport itself and impact um, at the lighthouse area of Milton. So it, it, it is very variable and location based, but on the whole, the recreational nodes um, of good. I think uh, maybe just to jump on to what, what Reid said, uh, you know, I will personally go and visit anyone who claims they have gotten sick because they were so much and try and get a good understanding from their point of view of what the experience was. We've got Every, I, I, I don't really know uh, what more we can do uh, to advertise the scientific water quality uh, as we receive it. Uh, so, you know, all oceans, the ocean is a living thing, right? It's, it's not full water, it's full of all sorts of bacteria you study uh, all this and stuff. So it is a lie. You, you obviously, I, I grew up on the ocean. I, I used to get air infections all the time as a kid, and that was when the city was a quarter of the size of this now. You know? Uh, so uh, obviously, all, uh, all health precautions and things aside, uh, you know, we've got lots of good quality water in Cape Town. The, the, the blue flags, for example, are fantastic. I believe that. Uh, but everyone must be whether it's the individual or city or other organization must take precautions to try and put up what's happening with me, one or other. So, I don't know if you follow up. Um, I kind of do. There's a new, around Barcoven Beach, there are stickers on all the signs and they look like they've been placed there recently. They have QR codes to a Facebook page and to a WhatsApp group that is essentially warning against the search levels around Cape Town um, and it reports dumpings and quality of the water levels or oh, yeah, the quality of the water and essentially I also just like to know oh, well you did answer it but how much accountability the city of Cape Town can then take for these problems because it's forums and groups like these that make it seem like I don't know um, like Cape Town is opposing what the public wants or like, I, you guys aren't complying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd love to chat to you a bit more about that afterwards. But I can, I'm just going to say one thing that's unequivocal. Uh, I don't think whether it's any politician, any of these scientists that give up their valuable time, or any of the officials, none of us want anyone to be swimming in dirty water. And none of us want anyone to get sick. And I also say this as someone that before I was a public representative was working as a conservationist. And now uh, a lot of the work that I do in my current job here uh, relies on my credibility as a conservationist that I will be you know, if I don't get me elected uh, often to you know. So I'm not going to ever, ever, ever say to someone or this to them uh, if it's not safe. Uh, because that will affect my career for the rest of my life. Uh, and uh, we made it incredibly clear we one of the first things that happened in the city of Cape Town when the mayor was elected was he said, all the data, all the raw data, however detailed it can be, uh, must be made available to anyone who is that we need to make uh, all measures available for that. And, and if you go to the second meeting 
agenda, we are actually receiving a report back on uh, our inland water quality dashboard. So we can actually have a more interactive app available. We can click on where you want to sort of be using the water and see the quality based on the data itself. So we're taking every measure to make sure that everyone knows. Uh, but there are also obviously people that maybe want to get more political about these things. Uh, that this is the forum for that, and I'll talk to you about that afterwards. Cool, thank you. Uh, sorry, and then um, that one, and then we will then we'll do the next one. Thank you, Jay. Uh, my name is Imran Pelika. I'm a process engineer at Sutari. Um, just a few comments from my side. Um, first one being regarding the permits. Um, I think what is important is that we uh, request further clarification or revision of the current permit that has been issued, um, specifically for TKNs. If you go to the, uh, the slide on out there, uh, there was ammonia concentrations and TKN concentrations. Um, so in the permit, it stated that um, for ammonia, the permit limit was 196 milligrams per liter, and the TKN concentration was 90. Um, so from a constituent point of view, uh, just for, for everyone's sake, the constituent that make up TKN, which is total, total control down nitrogen, it is from ammonia as well as organically bound nitrogen. Those, the sum of that makes up TKN. So from the permits, it stated that the TKN is lower than the ammonia concentration, uh, the limit, which doesn't make sense. So I think the 196 is less than, I think it was 90. So T TKN 140 M. TKN is 140 M? For, for out for out there. For out there. Out there, sorry. Yes, yeah, so the TKN is 90 milligrams and then the ammonia is 196. So I think it's important that we revise that, that number. It could possibly be a typo in the in the permit, um, that the ammonia limit is higher than the TKN it should actually be this. Um, so that is one comment on my side and then um, the next one being clarification on whether or not the ammonia is actually milligrams N per liter or milligrams NHT per liter. Uh, I know for Camsbay, you know, Camsbay and Greenpoint, that this specifies milligrams N per liter, whereas the ammonia uh, for hard base milligrams NHT per liter. So that just needs to be clarified whether or not it's, it's the, the, the makeup of that uh, difference between the two. Um, so those are my two comments on the permit itself. Um, and then with regards to, I think, overall compliancy um, from an effluent quality point of view, I think it's important that we um, try and get towards this idea of, and it speaks to what Dr. Dare said, about the organic loading or nutrient loading on the system, where it considers the volume, um, the volume difference together with the concentration. Um, I think it's important that if we are measuring concentrations, let's say at 9 o'clock every morning, and that's what scientific services for the independent specialists are measuring, um, that you actually measure or increase that frequency of monitoring across the day. I know the government does that it's, uh, weekly and monthly monitoring, but if we can actually increase the monitoring per day and actually measure what that diurnal variation from a concentration as well as um, volume point of view is, because you have your peaks in the morning, your peaks in the evening, and then your dips across the day. Um, yeah, so I think it's important to actually get that flow weighted average uh, in back. Uh, that would be more, I would say, more accurate and truly representative from a compliance point of view, as opposed to just checking what the concentration is, if it's less than the permit limit, and then tick. So you actually check what the, the flow weighted uh, loading is on the system. I think that would be uh, quite important. Yeah, so just those comments from myself. Thanks. It's a lot of work for you, actually. Eh? Wow. <laughs> uh, Mike? Yeah, I think, I mean, it does are some good points which you, which you make. I mean, can I ask that you um, address them also via email in case and I'll catch you in a minute to, to the to the West Point team? Um, the, Okay, uh, I, I would really like to move to the next agenda item, uh, but uh, what I will do is can I ask that uh, I'll give uh, Caroline and Leslie the chance to please be brief, 
there will also be an opportunity of aim for further engagement as well. Thank you. Just my question is, in the 2019 Hart Bay permit that was issued five years ago, there was a requirement to submit an improvement plan for the quality of the effluent. Was that ever submitted within three years of issuing of the plan of the permit? So my understanding is that uh, that was not issued. But we are in the process of looking at that at the moment. So whose responsibility is it to be compliant with the permit and why was it not done? Uh, Rush, can you address that? It will be the Rush. So unfortunately at the time I wasn't there and I came in the middle. So it doesn't really relieve me of it. But it should have been monitored. But it's one of the reasons we've now undertaken to do a current study to see that improvement and that's part of the current uh, reporting that's done to TFFE, it's also included in the notices. So it's really interesting. So when can we expect that treatment, that improvement plan, given that it's already two years overdue? So DFFE have stipulated timelines for us to submit to them, so once we've submitted to them, then we'll find out. Okay. Right. My question relates back to the bacterial counts that the, the person there and you were talking about. Um, none of the permits seem to have any requirements for bacterial count monitoring. Um, the effluent quality uh, Modeling is based on bacterial counts uh, using E. coli and enterococci. Um, so, could we please uh, request that that be put onto the agenda, uh, onto the permits again, or add it if it's not been there? Um, and I just want to once again say that we've picked up a huge amount of antimicrobial resistant bacteria in our environment. And many of these are pathogens that are disease-causing. Uh, e. coli is not necessarily disease-causing. It's an uh, indicator. Um, and we have detected that we have increasing resistance to antibiotics uh, because of the amount of antimicrobial resistant bacteria. So we really cannot ignore the bacterial load that is discharged by the marine heartfalls. And I know that Greg is going to say this is a problem right around the coastline, and I agree with you. And I didn't dispute the fact that the uh, influence from other wastewater treatment plants are contaminated. But it really is an issue that we have to deal with uh, in terms of our river quality, which will probably come up in the next uh, meeting. But with the marine outfalls, we cannot ignore it because it's, uh, these are discharges at recreational areas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think uh, important to just point out that uh, Jeremy and, and Dr. Barry Clark will speak to the monitoring program now and monitoring uh, water quality around the edge of the dispersion or mixing zone. But in terms of the dispersion modeling, which informs the mixing zone, the definition of that, when that was done, um, and that's done by expert modelers, and, and that's all available for people to read. The input into that data was we used the scientific uh, reference level of the high count of 10 to the 7 E. coli per 100 mils as the input value and 10 to the 6 intracocca per 100 mils as the input value. Generally in wastewater those counts will be lower and they will vary because there are other inputs from fresh water, storm water, mixing in the wastewater before it goes out there. In the dispersion modeling we use the maximum count that is referenced in the scientific literature for those two bacterial species rather than actual measure and that's 10, as I said, 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 6. 10 to the 7 E. coli, 10 to the 7 E. intracocca, which is input to dispersion modeling. You'll see now, Professor Patrick, the uh, monitoring program looks at uh, bacterial counts, which we've done over um, many years already, and it's all available people to see in terms of uh, where we sample those bacterial counts for the very reasons that you raised, and those are around the, uh, the diffusers of the outfalls, as well as between the outfalls and the shoreline, and again on the shoreline. So we, we agree with that, and we can cover that. And, um, our colleagues next, next to me will speak to that specifically in their presentation.
Okay, thank you so much for the feedback on that item. Uh, we do need to get moving for the purposes of time management, so I'm going to ask uh, Greg, uh, Barry, and Jeremy to, <coughs> to present the next item. Thank you. Thank you, Shell. Just introduce you, if I may. Um, we have uh, been conducting ongoing environmental monitoring on the three million outfalls from 2016 through to 2022. Um, then, uh, with the process that we're involved in now, where we appointed Infinity Environment, which is Jeremy Rose, along with Dr. Barry Clark, who's an expert uh, around these issues, is to develop a uh, next phase of a environmental monitoring plan, plan for the discharge points of the marine outfalls. So, this is the marine environment and the environmental monitoring side. Um, Jeremy will, and, and Dr. Clark will take us through that um, and we can have questions afterwards just to highlight the process. Uh, there's a requirement from DFFE that we submit this monitoring plan for their approval and sign off uh, by the first week of May, which is our intention to do that. And the only uh, the point that I want to make around that is the monitoring plan will be finalized by DFFE. We will make a submission and Jeremy is going to present that. Uh, but if, if you will then evaluate what you're proposing, and then if they sign off on that, uh, the monitoring plan is required to be implemented within 20 days of their signature. So that is the, the way forward around that, but we'll go through the detail, and if I can, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy and Barry next to me to take you through the details in that regard. Uh, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Chair. I was really hoping I wouldn't have to stand behind this podium. Uh, my name is Jeremy, I'm with Infinity Environmental. My background is uh, environmental science and I work as a consultant um, to the city and to various others as well, focusing the last few years specifically on water quality and some of the issues that uh, this forum, this committee was established to address. It's encouraging to see that on a Friday morning we have such a good turnout of people with um, an interest in these matters and a concerned and actively engaged citizenry as well as a panel of uh, uh, eminent experts in this field advising and holding the city to account. So thank you for that and please do keep it up. Um, we were appointed by the personal management branch to so the monitoring program that I'm going to present. I'm going to stand like this. <laughs> well, the, the monitoring program that I'm going to present um, was developed in, in consultation with the personal management branch who's been doing this work for many years with various service providers. Um, and of course, Barry Clark, who um, uh, welcome to present after me. Uh, he's going to talk to a lot in detail. I'm going to give a general introduction to the intended monitoring program. And then myself and two of my colleagues, uh, Tom and Olivia, who are here, um, putting together what's been quite a, an interesting challenge to prepare uh, to monitor not what's going out of the pipe, but what the effects of that are. Because that, I think, is the question which many of us um, would have about marine outfalls and our wastewater management in general. It's not necessarily so much uh, the volume and the, the ammonia levels in the effluent itself which would concern us, it's does that have a measurable effect, is it a risk to um, our health as swimmers on the coast and specifically um, my concern is it a risk to the ecological and, and uh, biophysical environment which makes get on uh, what it is. So, Briefly, uh, we're going to touch on wastewater management in general, and I apologize to those of you for whom this is either uh, an oversimplification or um, something which you're very well aware of, but just I think it's useful context to understand where the outfalls fit into our, uh, our wastewater management system. We're a city of four and a half million people, and all of the, the waste that we produce has to go somewhere. And then let's talk about outfalls, how they're designed, what, uh, what we mean when we say mixing zone or a, a zone of initial dilution, because those terms are going to come up quite a bit when we talk about the monitoring plan itself. And specifically getting into um, some of what we've heard already around the, the three outfalls, Greenpoint, Camps Bay, and Hard Bay, and how each of them is uh, specified and stipulated. We'll then talk about um, how one goes about designing an environmental monitoring program like this, what, uh, what considerations need to be taken into account, what the principles are, um, what we're going to monitor, how we're going to monitor it, and uh, what we're comparing it against, because I think the critical part of this is not just to get numbers uh, and data, but to understand uh, the effects, the, the outcomes, um, and whether there is a measurable change, whether we're seeing, as Greg put it, a, a deleterious impact. And then Barry, I'll hand over to you. Barry will take us through um, the individual monitoring plans for some of the various parameters. There are a total of six, each with its own set of specifications. Um, and then we'll talk briefly about what happens after this, as has already come up. Uh, the National Department of Forestry, Fisheries and the Environment needs to approve what, uh, whatever is proposed here. 
and then the, the implementation follows on from that. So what are we trying to achieve? Why are we here? Um, really to, to provide for monitoring of environmental effects. So what do we mean by that? It's a change which is measurable, a change which has uh, uh, an outcome uh, which is negative or positive in this case, of course, we're mostly concerned about negative impacts. And that's the discharge of wastewater through these three marine outfalls um, into the coastal and natural environments. And to build on uh, a fairly long a history of monitoring of these outfalls and the coastal water quality, we're not intending to reinvent the wheel. We want to make sure that when we're talking about long term change, that we are able to compare it back to data which we already have. Um, and then lastly, an important part of this and an uh, important part of the Thermos Advisory Forum's mandate is uh, to assess compliance and to advise the city um, on mitigation if there is not compliance. The, the monitoring program um, implemented by the city on our behalf with public money needs to be practical, it needs to uh, be implementable, and it needs to be scientifically sound. And I'm really looking forward to the inputs from uh, those on my right in particular, but also from members of the public and other experts who are here in the audience, as to what we need to achieve in a way which is um, defensible, it's rigorous enough to actually be able to draw conclusions. Um, and importantly, you know, I'm here now, but I may not be uh, responsible for aspects of this in a year or two years. So if the city appoints others through its procurement processes, this program needs to be repeatable. It needs to be able to continue over time and continue to build up that data. Um, I mentioned public money, so we need to be conscious of the fact that unlimited monitoring, while it would be nice from a scientific perspective, is extremely expensive. Um, and so a key component of this monitoring program is the balance of uh, how we spend public funds against the ability to draw meaningful conclusions. We would be wasting our time and effort if we gathered data which didn't allow us to say the impact is X or Y. We would be wasting whatever money we had spent on the data if we did too little monitoring. But there is also the converse of that, is that budgets have to be allocated to this, and whatever our budget is allocated to marine outfall monitoring is not allocated to some other aspects of municipal service provision. So how do we draw that balance? It's been a, a debate throughout the um, preparation of this monitoring program. We think we've achieved a reasonably good um, set of proposals, but uh, keen for inputs and feedback on that, both from you and also from the authorities when this is uh, taken to them for review. It needs to be sustainable, as I've mentioned. It's uh, particularly important in such dynamic coastal environments that you're not just looking at individual snapshots. And I think the same point was made by uh, a member of the uh, a visitor to this, to this forum, that it's not useful just to have 9 a.m. on a Sunday um, once off. You know, it's, it's necessary to be able to compare where the data is gathered against long-term uh, data sets to be able to understand the long-term change. A similar point was made by Dr. Winter in his book of bioaccumulation and also by Professor Petri uh, regarding contaminants of emerging concern. If we don't have long-term data, it's very difficult to say whether alphas are in fact um, having a negative impact or not, and if they are the extent to which that is the case. So being able to flag those long-term trends and make sure whichever information is produced through this program is relevant. Um, and relevant specifically to decision making. It's not just information for the sake of information, but you know, any, any monitoring program implemented uh, by the city for its residents needs to be about improving processes, improving decision making, and improving ultimately the management of uh, the resources that we elect our councils to manage. So we need to be able to draw those meaningful conclusions about impacts. A bit of background, um, and those on the uh, Section 80 committee uh, will be very, very familiar with this, but the marine outfalls are quite a small part of the city's wastewater management system. About 95% of the license capacity in the last five years ago when these numbers uh, were generated is through conventional activated sludge treatment plants. And there are, uh, I believe, something like 37 of those across the city, and then the, the three marine outfalls which uh, We've all seen pictures of Greenpoint, Campsville, and Hout Bay uh, make up a total of 5% of the license capacity of um, discharge of wastewater uh, into the environment. The other point to note is that although the outfalls are the only places where uh, wastewater is discharged directly into the marine environment, every single one of our wastewater treatment works discharges ultimately onto the coastal environment through the rivers, through the stormwater systems, and in some cases directly uh, into the surf zone or onto the beach. So 
all of the wastewater which is uh, produced and treated ends up in the sea um, unless it is reused. In that case, it probably goes back into the sewer afterwards anyway. So uh, we're looking at a small part of a very large system. Um, and to the point about the effective management of these resources, um, there is a significant challenge um, faced by the city in managing the infrastructure across the municipality. We mustn't lose sight of that in looking specifically at the marine outfalls. So what do we mean by waste of the treatment? Because it comes up uh, in some of the uh, permits and we've heard that the waste, the, the marine outfalls discharge untreated effluent or uh, effluent with only, to put it more accurately, preliminary treatment. And there are various levels of waste of treatment which uh, municipalities and others implement from preliminary through to tertiary. Preliminary effectively means you take the large solids out to remove the rags, um, the wet wipes, and everything else which gets flushed down toilets and shouldn't be. Um, and it may also include a level of filtration in the settings. So you take the solids out of the wastewater before it is um, either treated further or discharged into the marine environment. Primary treatment is I'm putting this very simply with apologies to Rajon and others who are experts in this place. Um, if sedimentation, flocculation, um, allowing the, uh, the more solid material to um, sediment out, to settle out, and we remove that from the waste stream uh, before wastewater is then subjected usually to secondary treatment, which means you're taking out the organic matter, you're taking out the biological, uh, the uh, nutrients, and the uh, solid organics. And you do that usually using bacteria. Um, to uh, uh, conduct the treatment process. In some cases, and specifically where uh, the intention is to reuse treated effluents, there may then be a, a fourth level of tertiary treatment, which also takes out non biodegradable pollutants. It's typically quite an expensive and quite a complex process, and it's not usually done for uh, municipal domestic wastewater, but rather by industries or by others where there is an intention to reuse or to uh, remove specific contaminants from the wastewater. So most of Cape Town's wastewater um, goes through primary and secondary treatment before it is discharged into the inland water bodies or directly onto the coast. Uh, these three outfalls only use preliminary treatment um, before dispersing the effluent into the marine environment, uh, removing only the, the rags and solid waste. Um, whereas secondary treatment produces other waste streams, um, it produces sludge, which has to be managed usually uh, to landfill, um, and then the final effluent is discharged or reused, usually after disinfection to get rid of the bacteria. Um, tertiary treatment would produce uh, typically effluent of such quality that it's likely to be used again rather than discharged directly. So just comparing um, land-based treatment, our standard waste of treatment against marine outfalls, both of them have the same goal, and the goal is to release effluent, which we cannot avoid producing. Um, at levels and in ways which avoid impacting on either the environment or on users, human users of the environment. Um, the goal is the same, they do that in very different ways. So land-based wastewater treatment will remove um, the, the bulk of nutrients and organics when it's done effectively, and those are then disposed of to land as sludges or before we use themselves, whereas marine disposal relies on dilution and dispersion to achieve levels that uh, are acceptable from an environmental quality perspective. And that, of course, is very dependent on where you are discharging. So we call that the assimilative of capacity. Um, if you imagine discharging it into a swimming pool versus into the sea, you'll get a sense of the effects of um, where you are putting the, uh, the quantity of wastewater which is disposed of. Um, and as was mentioned earlier by Greg Tippecky, work is done to determine what that assimilative of capacity is in designing an outfall and determining its design capacity. That doesn't mean that it is time for all contaminants, but uh, certainly for the more common ones which have been historically managed for. Um, with land-based wastewater treatment, pathogens, so uh, bacteria, viruses, um, and other pathogens are removed uh, to a greater or lesser extent before discharge, and usually that's with um, a disinfection method, either maturation plants or UV treatment or with the addition of, of curing or bleach. Um, whereas with marine disposal, uh, we rely on the uh, dilution again, but also on the die off in the saline environment of those pathogens before they reach um, uh, human receptors, people who are going to be at risk. 
And then a similar point for both land-based and marine disposal, this is one made by Professor Petri earlier, is that persistent and virgin contaminants may not be, or in fact are not effectively removed by most methods of wastewater treatment, again to a greater or lesser extent depending on the specific chemical, but they may bioaccumulate and then they accumulate in the environment. That is the case for land-based treatment as well as for marine disposal. How the outfalls work? Um, our bulk sewers uh, flow to a, a pump station, as we call it, in the case of Square, and uh, is then pumped from there after undergoing screening and uh, filtration in some cases through a pipeline out to sea and uh, pumped through a diffuser structure. The diffuser is effectively just a, a number of ports or um, you know, carefully designed holes in that, in that pipe, which are spaced in such a way that at the pressure expected, you are able to achieve maximum um, dilution and mixing at the point of discharge. So we have what's called an initial dilution zone. So as the, the liquid wastewater is pumped out through that diffuser structure, it's fresh water, so it's a lot more buoyant than salt water. It rises quite quickly. Uh, it's typically warmer as well. And then you have the velocity of water exiting those um, diffuser ports, which causes the mixing and it causes the effluent to rise buoyantly towards the surface of the ocean. Most of these uh, outfalls are located uh, many tens of meters below sea level and rely on the uh, buoyancy of that fluid to achieve the mixing uh, before it reaches um, the upper levels of, of the sea. And then you have what's called secondary dilution, which is where the broader currents and other influences, waves, wind, start to play a role in how the effluent fluid is dispersed and uh, dissolved. Uh, not dissolve, but that means it into, into the receiving environment. So we talk about the area in close proximity to the diffuser as the near field, and um, the point at which the initial dilution, so the initial buoyancy, the initial mixing stops having an effect, is the, the edge of the zone of initial dilution, and the point at which those secondary dilution effects start to play a role. As the effluent plume reaches closer to the surface and it's exposed to sunlight, and that's also where you start to see the die-off of the bacterial loads, which were mentioned earlier. So it's a bit of a simplification, but this is the process on which marine outfalls rely in order to achieve um, the, uh, the standards or the, the guidelines against which we're going to compare them. So just a few definitions. Um, the zone of initial dilution is a physical area. It's the area in which the uh, effluent ceases to be uh, diluted through those buoyancy and mixing effects. and um, it may be smaller or larger than what is called the allowable mixing zone. Because this is extremely complex um, for the authorities to determine how to regulate, how to manage, how to measure the changes or the acceptability of the level of dilution, um, a, an area will be allowable or uh, regulatory mixing zone is defined around the alpha. And that's the point at which you say, can we still measure the effects of the effluent at levels that are of concern? So that's defined um, in a set of guidelines which has been revised over the years. There's a 2004 version and there's a 2012 version and there's a few others. But effectively they, they say the same thing, which is that if you're discharging at the coastline into the sea, um, into the, the surf area where people swim, the allowable mixing zone, the point at which there should be um, no concern about the effects, is right at the outfall. Because of course that's where it's possible that people will interact with it and will um, have, it will be exposed to some of the potential emittents. If you're discharging offshore, uh, which is where all of the three outfalls that we are uh, looking at uh, are located, so that's greater than 10 meters below the sea surface, um, it's a much wider area where you expect to see some effects, but you measure on the outside of that, of that uh, mixing zone, and that's defined in the, in the guidelines as 300 meters away from the diffuser. Now, none of these diffusers, none of our outfalls have just a single point of discharge. They're um, spread out along the pipe, as you can see in the picture behind me. And the allowable mixing zone is elongated to maintain the same area as it would be if it were a 300 meter circle, 300 meter radius circle. So it's a, um, a regulatory construct which allows us to measure change at a defined and agreed upon point. Um, and it may differ from where that initial dimension is happening. But effectively, what we need to achieve is meeting guidelines, meeting environmental quality standards at the edge of that uh, allowable mixing zone. And you'll see when Barry presents the plan itself that uh, many of the monitoring points established for this monitoring program are defined along that edge. 
Design capacity on this has been covered, so I won't spend a lot of time on it, but just to bear in mind that there is a difference between the total amount of liquid pumped out through a pipeline and the total amount of wastewater pumped out through a pipeline. During storm events, it's possible that you're adding fresh water without necessarily having more pollutants. Uh, the outfalls were designed by engineers to achieve uh, effective dilution and dispersion of wastewater and not of uh, stormwater, which would tend simply to uh, improve the quality rather than uh, decrease it. But, but all of that is taken into account when deciding how deep to discharge, how far offshore, um, at what height above the seabed, and what the diffusers need to look like, how long they are, and how many ports they have, and how those ports are designed. Um, the three outfalls uh, we've heard a little bit about from, from Mike already, but they are located, of course, Greenpoint, Camps Bay, and Hout Bay. Greenpoint is the largest, it's about 700 millimeters internal diameter, and the other two are half of that, uh, that diameter and they discharge at depths uh, between 23 meters in Camps Bay all the way down to quite a deep 39 meters in the heart there. And we've heard about the distinction between the permitted capacities, which don't always align very well with the uh, design capacities. Greenpoint uh, discharges wastewater from everywhere, including toilets in this building. Um, the Woodstock area through to Banshee Bay, most of it is residential. There are, of course, commercial and some industrial uses in this area as well. It was designed for 40 megalitres. It uh, has a permit of volume of 25, and as we've seen, it's discharging on average around about that permit of volume at present. 16 ports, and the allowable mixing zone, which I mentioned, is uh, defined around the edge of that uh, diffuser structure, 256 of these specific metres away from the diffuser. Um, it has a discharge permit which was get to January 2023 or December 2022, depending on which signature you look at. Um, Camps Bay, much smaller, designed for 5 megalitres a day, permits it at more than twice that, and uh, discharges almost exclusively domestic wastewater, so very little uh, commercial or industrial uses in that area. Eight ports on the diffuser, and that makes for a mixing zone of 274 metres <coughs> the diffusion structure, and it also has a permit date since 2022. Hout Bay, um, similar makeup of the effluent, but Hout Bay used to have industry, and much of it is, is no longer there, and it's largely domestic. Designed for 9.8, permitted at 5, uh, again because of some administrative mix up that we've seen, um, and has an allowable mixing zone of 272 meters. So, just to note, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the detail, but uh, the environmental monitoring program, which we're going to discuss now, is not uh, the first of its kind. There have been a number of efforts uh, over the years, going back as far as 1990, to monitor the effects of the marine outfalls on the environment. They're focused on different things, um, and each of them is conducted, of course, under the constraints of its own um, budgetary allocations and uh, time allocations. But they, they give us a picture of the time of the existing information. All of these are uh, these reports, particularly the later ones, are publicly accessible along with uh, summaries of them, giving a sense of um, what the long-term uh, data would suggest. What's important for us is to make sure that where there are um, aspects which need to be repeated and which need to be built upon, that those are incorporated into the current monitoring program. So the city monitors, as you've heard, around all the beaches, uh, the microbiological, so bacterial pollution, um, but then there have been, and that's an ongoing program, but then there have been these additional programs to monitor sediment uh, toxicity of the effluent to monitor for uh, pharmaceuticals in some cases, um, as well as um, bioaccumulation, which was handled in 2023 to 2022. Before I hand over to Barry, I'm just going to talk about the principles. We spoke about the objectives, but in determining a monitoring program, um, there are a number of principles which have guided uh, the professional team appointed by the city. Our purpose is to monitor environmental impact. Um, it's not focused on uh, the effluent itself, it's on changes to environmental parameters and comparison of those against background values so we can understand if. Water quality is worse around the outfall than it is or than it would be expected to be in an area unimpacted by that outfall. Um, so, to understanding the background values is a key part of this, and also then uh, a key part of it is understanding guidelines and standards against which we need to uh, compare the results so that um, there is an understanding of risk and of impact because um, 
numbers on their own operating universe. It's important to have some level of threshold for the pipeline against which to can do that. Um, and then against historical data, so one of the other things we want to understand is the assimilative capacity which was determined for these R is appropriate. Are we meeting uh, the expected outcomes based on the current design and the current loading and the current volumes of uh, ethylene being discharged? Uh, were the assumptions made correct or are we seeing um, are we seeing changes over time which would suggest that we have exceeded the assimilative capacity of each of those receiving environments? So there are a number of guidelines and standards against which we need to compare results. Uh, the first one is the permanent conditions, although they are largely silent on specific environmental quality objectives, uh, they do require that an environmental monitoring program should be approved by the FFE, and that's the document which we have now uh, drafted for that approval. And then they also require that the permit holder in the city must demonstrate compliance with the South African water quality guidelines. So specifically, that's the first of marine waters guidelines, first uh, approved in 1995, and there's a few draft versions, none of which has been called final. Uh, the most recent one is issued last month, which sets environmental quality objectives. So they uh, focus on the protection of biodiversity and of recreational users, the, the health of uh, humans using the sea and the coast. And they set um, guideline values around temperature, around salinity, pH, oxygen, as well as trace methods and hydrocarbons. And those need to be met, importantly, not at the point at which the alpha discharges, but at the point at which the dispersion and dilution has had its effects. And that's uh, in terms of the regulatory mixing zone or allowable mixing zone, uh, is where many of these measurements will be taken. Similarly, for recreational use, and here the focus, of course, is are there pathogens or are there bacteria or viruses in? Uh, the marine environment which would have an impact on human health. Uh, so meeting those quality objectives um, specifically related to people using the environment which are based on risk uh, analysis to understand if you swim, what's the likelihood that you would um, uh, become sick based on various levels of, of indicator bacteria in the environment. For sediments, there is a set of guidelines developed for the Uwena current um, areas of so South Africa and Ghana and Libya. And uh, those set guideline values specifically to protect ecosystems. So, again, we'll be comparing against those. For most of the parameters that we will be discussing, there are no uh, established or accepted guidelines. And so, the, the focus is going to have to be on is there measurable change and is there um, in various things about the ecological effects? Are we seeing outcomes in terms of uh, marine life which relate back to some of these uh, parameters? Then we have to select sites of which to monitor. Each of these outfalls is located in a very dynamic coastal environment, um, so we need to be able to assess compliance. And assessing compliance, as we said, is done around the environment mixing zone, so we set up a bunch of monitoring sites uh, around that area. And then importantly for many of the members of the public here, I think uh, that the concern will be about risk to human health, to sensitive receptors like beach swimmers, and people using surfing and uh, um, scuba diving around Cape Town's beaches. So sites have then been established to allow for us to assess the bacteri bacteriological, microbiological um, parameters in those areas. Sites have also been, wherever possible, duplicated or replicated based on past efforts. So it would be very useful to be able to say at this exact point in 2015, um, we saw the following uh, change over, over a 10 year or a 20 year period. Um, and to be able to link that back to uh, all the changes or potentially to the outfalls themselves. Um, a big part of uh, this monitoring program, it has to be said, is to manage costs. It's, uh, it's not um, feasible to do all of the, the monitoring which, uh, um, which, which might answer some questions that uh, are not necessarily relevant to management. So we've had to manage uh, where the sites are located in order to uh, achieve useful information to be able to make decisions. But uh, we're not putting a monitoring site every 10 meters um, between Robben Island and the beach because it would become unaffordable. And then a big part of this is, is also to understand what's happening in the background, um, which the marine outfall, each of them discharges into a marine environment which is affected by, which is affected by factors from uh, stormwater outfalls to uh, other coastal discharge points to um, pollutants and contaminants coming from harbors or from uh, ships, from marine mammals. We need to understand where the outfalls themselves are having an effect, and we need to therefore be able to compare that against some form of reference or control site. 
so the, the program has established four reference sites. It's important to note that these are not going to be pristine um, sites, they're not going to be completely unimpacted by humans, they're in Cape Town, um, but the idea is to be able to say, are the outfalls significantly affecting um, the area around them relative to other uh, urban coastal areas, which are the areas that have at least uh, minimized the effects of obvious point sources of pollution to get a sense of uh, the, the background there to compare against. And then, how, what do we measure and how often? Um, we need to monitor for pollution in water um, and in sediment, but we also need to understand are there marine organisms that are taking that out, which are um, perhaps accumulating it and having an effect on their um, survival or life cycle. Monitoring risks to human health is a big part of this. It's uh, probably the, the main driving factor between, uh, behind the need to monitor these, uh, these outfalls and their impacts on the environment. And then also the long term impacts on marine life, marine biodiversity, and the ecological the ecosystems surrounding each of the, the outfalls. So, in, in each of those cases, we need to manage um, the costs and the benefits of the frequency of the, the monitoring efforts because. Uh, monitoring daily, what it would give us amazing long term data, uh, would also cost uh, far more than the city is likely to be able to afford. So, very will speak to the uh, selection of frequencies for each of them, why each of those has been uh, selected. I'm going to pause there and hand over to Dr. Barry Clark from Anchor Environment, who is a marine scientist who's been working in this field, I think, for longer than I've been alive. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks very much. Um, very talk. Uh, I'm a marine ecologist. I've been working as a consultant for about 27 years now. I've uh, looked at marine outfalls all the way around South Africa, all of the major centres in South Africa, from Richard Bay on the east coast, all the way to Alexander Bay on the west coast. So I've been asked to help with the design and development of this monitoring program. Um, Jeremy's given you a nice background and philosophy of how we, of what, of what we had to consider when designing the program. I'm going to talk more to the details of the program itself. There are six uh, broader components that the monitoring program is divided into six broad components. The first component we want to look at concentrations of contaminants in seawater around the outfalls to understand what, what, how these contaminants are, are diluting in the seawater as they're released into the ocean. The second one looks at concentrations of contaminants in sediment around those outfalls. We know certain contaminants tend to accumulate in sediments, so that gives us a slightly longer term perspective on, on, on uh, how concentrations are, are uh, changing in the environment over time. The third component is going to look at whole effluent toxicity of the water surrounding that outfall, so we know as those contaminants are released into the environment, they start reacting with, with parameters in the environment, they react with other components in the effluent. We want to understand what is the residual toxicity once they've been released into the environment. There's different components look at different things and they answer different questions. Concentration of contaminants in seawater gives you an instantaneous picture of what is happening in the environment as they are released. There's a lot of variability there as a result of conditions in the environment, climate, weather, uh, concentrations of those contaminants in the effluent. Um, it doesn't necessarily answer questions about biological availability. We know some contaminants are toxic to the environment, but we don't necessarily know whether they are bioavailable, whether they can be taken up by marine organisms. So we need to address that through the other programs. And it doesn't also answer questions about synergistic effects of the different contaminants when they're Organisms are exposed to them uh, in concert. I mentioned just now con concentration of contaminants in sediments, important because they integrate effects over time, and uh, contaminants tend to absorb on the, onto the sediments and they um, give us a longer term picture. It is affected by particle size of those sediments, so we need to look at that as well. Again, it doesn't necessarily consider biological availability but we do have other elements that look at that. The whole effluent toxicity testing, as I mentioned now, seeks to look at the actual toxicity of those elements once they've been released into the environment. It does consider biological availability and it does consider uh, synergistic effects. There's another three sets of uh, components in the monitoring program that we have included here. 
The fourth one looks at concentration of contaminants in tissues of living organisms. So once those contaminants are released with the effluent into the marine environment, some of them are taken up by living organisms, uh, such as trace metals, contaminants of immersion concern, the pharmaceuticals we spoke about just now, and uh, those, some of those contaminants cannot be excreted by the organisms, so they build up over time in those organisms, and uh, so that gives us an even longer term perspective on how those contaminants are behaving in the environment and what the risks are both to the organisms themselves but also to human health because we as people eat many of those organisms. So we need to understand how they are absorbing and then concentrating those organisms, those, those contaminants in their tissues. Um, the fourth and fifth component of the monitoring program looks at the actual ecological effects of those contaminants on the community, the marine communities that are in the environment. Some species are more sensitive to contaminants than others. So where those contaminants are concentrations that exceed the, the, the sensitivity or the tolerance levels of those organisms, those organisms tend to move away or they die out. So we see changes in the communities around those artfuls and those can inform us about the toxicity of the effluent that is introduced into the environment. And then finally, we have a focal area looking specifically at contaminants of emerging concern, uh, which focuses on a selection of pharmaceuticals, personal care products that may be released from the effluent into the water. It's very expensive to analyze these parameters. In fact, we can't even analyze them. None of the labs in South Africa can look at those contaminants of emerging concerns. They need to go to laboratories in Europe. So yes, we want to look at those, but it's expensive and uh, needs to be done at lower frequency, some of the other parameters. So um, just in summary, we've got six components here. Seawater, eco ecotoxicity, sediment quality, then ecological effects, bioaccumulation effects, and contaminants of emerging concern. And we're seeking to implement a comprehensive monitoring program that looks at all of those components at different frequencies at different sites. And I'll give you a quick rundown on, on what those sites are and what those frequencies are. Very importantly, as both Greg and Jeremy have stressed, this is a provisional proposal that we've put to the city. It still needs to be approved by the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, which is the permitting authority. If they accept what we are proposing, then it will be put into action. Um, starting with the water quality component of the monitoring program, here we're looking at both physical chemical properties of the seawater around the outfalls, also looking at and specific parameters there, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, we're looking at micro microbial parameters in the environment, specifically intestinal enterococci, which is the best indicator of risk associated with pathogenic organisms that are released into the sea from these outfalls. Third component is looking at nutrients. Um, and the fertilization effects of the, of the effluent on the marine environment, and finally trace metals, many of which are toxic to marine organisms. You can see the, uh, if I put that up a little bit bigger, you can see the uh, uh, proposed monitoring stations of the Camps Bay outfalls. Some of them are highlighted in yellow. Those will be the stations that we monitor most frequently, monthly, which is including the physical chemical and the microbial parameters. The other stations without the yellow highlighting are lower frequency looking at nutrients and trace metals, and that will be quarterly, and they're focused around the edge of that allowable mixing zone. So that gives us compliance with environmental quality objectives and ultimately compliance with urban conditions. And those, there are one or two stations located a little bit further away, and they're aligned along the the, the trajectory where the plume of effluent is likely to go and also in towards the sensitive receptors, the bathing beaches and sensitive um, uh, areas in the marine environment that we are interested in. Uh, that gives you the, the stations for the Hart Bay outfall, same as the Greenpoint and Camps Bay outfalls. They are um, concentrated around the outfall themselves but also in the, along the direct, direction where the effluent is likely to travel and towards those sensitive receptors. And very importantly, Jeremy mentioned reference sites. 
we need to understand, we need something to compare those results to. There's no point in just monitoring contaminants around the articles. We need context. We know that, unfortunately, the marine environment of the city of Cape Town, around the Cape Peninsula, is contaminated both by the articles but also other sources. We know, for example, that contaminants of emerging concern have been picked up in Antarctica, miles away from any, any source of those contaminants. So we need to understand, if we want to isolate the impact those articles are having, on the environment, we need reference stations that we can compare them to. We've got reference there, one reference station on the uh, west side of Robben Island, one off the Kobunkelberg, uh, one off Chapman's Peak, and another one off the Crayfish Coast. We are confident that those are sufficiently far away from each of the three major articles we're looking at to be able to isolate the impacts of the articles on the immediate environment around them relative to other effects that may be happening around the peninsula. Uh, third, sorry, second component of the monitoring program which I mentioned is the looking at sediment quality monitoring. Here we're interested in the impacts the articles may be having on the physical properties of those sediments. So a particle size distribution, specific gravity, the organic com contaminants that may be accumulating in those sediments. Here we're thinking specifically of organic carbon, but also uh, things called PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols, total petroleum hydrocarbons associated with oils, petrol, diesel, and then something known as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are the ones that are of particular concern. They are they are have been shown to be carcinogenic, and those are the ones we're particularly concerned about. Um, and then finally, trace metals in the sediments. Trace metals tend to adhere to the sediment particles and can accumulate in the sediments over time. Um, the, the, pic, the map on the left shows you the contact, contaminant monitoring stations around the Greenpoint outfall. These will be monitored twice a year, summer and winter. We've also included a couple of monitoring stations off to the east there in Table Bay, off the deep river near to the, uh, the mouth of the port of Cape Town as we can believe these can provide us some insights into isolating the impacts of the Greenpoint outfall and other sources of pollutants in that area. Uh, next up is the Camps Bay outfall. We've got the stations around the, the allowable mixing zone. We want to know how, at what rate contaminants are accumulating in the sediments in that area, but also those on the line towards the sensitive receptors, the Camps Bay beach, and uh, the likely trajectory for, this, for the for the effluent based on modeling studies up to the north. Finally, Hart Bay, again, lots of monitoring stations around the edge of the outfall and then also towards the sensitive receptors. Same parameters, same monitoring frequency. And again, our reference stations, Robin Island, Kabonkaberg, Chapman's Peak, and uh, Crayford Factory, same as for the water quality monitoring stations. Ecotoxicity, here we're focusing on toxicity of seawater immediately around the outfalls at the edge of that mixing zone. And what we do here is we collect water samples from those sites, take them back to our laboratory, and we um, use sea urchin gametes, eggs and sperm, which we, fer we, we look at rates of fertilization of those gametes in those water samples, and we compare them to clean artificial seawater and also seawater samples that we collect from reference sites a bit further away. We know, we don't expect 100% fertilization in those samples, but we want to know how fertilization rates at the edge of that allowable mixing zone compare to what is the best possible achievable fertilization rates. And that gives us insight into the toxicity of the more seawater immediately around those outfalls. And again, Camps Bay, those sites around the edge of the mixing zone, out Bay around the mixing zone, and then our reference sites further away. We want to know how is, are there, is the effluent that is being uh, released from the outfalls causing the water around the outfalls to be toxic or more toxic than seawater anywhere else. Bioaccumulation, that speaks to the rates at which certain contaminants like trace metals and, uh, and CDCs, contaminants of emerging concern, are, are accumulate in the tissues of living organisms. We've got two components here. The first one is an experimental uh, 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 testing protocol where we will collect 
uh, European black mussels from the shoreline uh, used right around the world as, as a bioindicator of bioaccumulation. You take a batch of these, these uh, mussels and suspend them at sites around the edge of the outfall, on the edge of the mixing zone. We leave them there for a period of six weeks and we look at the rates at which they are taking up trace metals from the environment, from the seawater. We compare those with our reference stations, which I'll show you just now, to get an idea to, to answer the question, are, trace, are the mussels accumulating trace metals and other bioaccumulative materials at a faster rate than they are elsewhere on the peninsula? We're also looking directly at total levels of uh, trace metals and other bioaccumulative materials in mussels on the shoreline and other organisms, specifically rock lobsters and fish. We're looking at the Cape Cotton here specifically to answer our questions as to what is the total level of trace metals in those organisms around the outfalls. That's where, that speaks to human health risk. We know people are collecting mussels from the shoreline. We know people are collecting fish, rock lobster from those areas. They're consuming those organisms and we need to be able to answer the question, are those posing a risk to human health of people living in Cape Town? And uh, similar for Camps Bay, we have a series of stations around the outfalls where we do our experimental monitoring work and then outfalls closer to the the sites close to the shore where we know people are collecting organisms, uh, marine organisms for consumption, and we can answer the questions about risks that they may pose to human health. Hard Bay, very similar. And then finally, the same suite of reference sites that we spoke about earlier, they will answer the question of, is, are, are these contaminants accumulating faster at, at sites around the outfalls than those further, further afield? Um, the final component was, the second from final component of the monitoring program is looking at the contaminants of emerging concern, uh, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, we're looking at 20 of the, of the, of the, of these um, CDCs that have been detected most commonly in marine waters around South Africa, marine and estuarine waters around South Africa. Here we're looking at levels of these contaminants both in seawater but also in the living organisms, marine organisms that are consumed by people in Cape Town. And we have a series of monitoring stations directly around the outfall at the edge of that allowable mixing zone, but then also at sites further afield to try and give ourselves us some understanding of what are the differences and how much of those contaminants we think are linked to these marine outfalls. Camp space in the picture, sites on the edge of that allowable mixing zone and sites close to the shore where we know people are harvesting green organisms for their own consumption. Likewise for Hart Bay. And then finally, again, our reference stations, we need something to compare those samples that we collect from the outfalls to, to be able to understand, to, to, to elicit how much of the, uh, the accumulation is associated with the outfalls versus other sources of, of, of contamination around the peninsula. Finally, ecological effects monitoring, this is the gold standard. This tells us are these contaminants, that, or any of the contaminants we're measuring in the environment actually having an impact on the marine life in that area. So we want to look at changes in benthic macrofauna, organisms that live in the sediment surrounding the outfalls, and then also organisms that are living on the hard substratum, the, the, the reefs that uh, are present around the outfalls and uh, in some cases the outfalls are largely surrounded by sandy seabed areas so we can focus on the organisms that are living in the sediment. In other areas like the Greenpoint outfall here it's mostly surrounded by rocky reef areas so we need to look at those organisms to understand what are the impacts of, uh, of the outfalls on those communities. We're in a very fortunate position here in that South African National Parks is implementing or has been implementing a very comprehensive monitoring program over the last 20 years where they're looking at 164 sites around the peninsula at marine communities associated with hard substrata around the peninsula. So we're going to implement a similar monitoring program here where we can then compare our sites with the 164 sites which Sand Parks is implementing. We can get a very, very clear picture of is there something changing around the outfalls which is different to what's going on elsewhere? And there again for Camps Bay, similar seat of sites and Hart Bay, 
And of course, you've seen the reference last before. Same, same situation. We want to understand, is what's happening around the art force different to what's happening everywhere else? And that's um, a Honda Rendogram, which puts all of those elements together. The water quality, the sediment quality, the toxicity testing, the bioaccumulation, the, the contaminants of emerging concern, ecological monitoring, and uh, it just gives you an indication of how many sites we are going to be, we intend looking at for each of those parameters and each of our falls and also of the frequency. I don't want to go, I don't want to repeat myself by going through all of that information, but it's all there and it's all, um, I think, a very extremely comprehensive thorough monitoring program. Um, in terms of reporting requirements, we will be issuing, or well, there will be, uh, whoever implements this monitoring program needs to provide an annual report to the Department of Environmental Affairs to, uh, on, the, on the results and also to this Permit Advisory Forum. forum. There will be uh, quarterly presentations to the Permit Advisory Forum on the results as they come in and then also a three-year marine impact assessment report which draws together the results of all of those different components and seeks to answer the questions that many of you, I think, have. Um, and then in terms of next steps, uh, this draft uh, monitoring program is pretty much final. Our uh, intention is currently under review by key experts from the CSIR and the South African National Parks, and uh, they are required to provide their comment by the end of this month. The, the proposed program will then be submitted to the Department of Environmental Affairs and Forestry for approval by the 4th of May, and uh, within 20 days of them of the department approving the, the monitoring program, the city needs to start to implement that. So looking at about the early 1st of July as an implementation date. I can say to you honestly that this is probably the most comprehensive and most intensive monitoring program that I've seen implemented anywhere in this country. And uh, I think I have enormous faith that if we get, if we're able to implement the program as, as, as structured here, I'm confident that uh, it'll provide the answers we're looking for in terms of understanding any impacts associated with our Thank you. Thank you so much for this extensive presentation, uh, Jeremy Barry. Uh, are there any questions at this point? Okay. So, whoa, 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 okay. Cool. So, we'll do uh, prof, prof day. Uh, full and then Paul in the first round. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Jeremy and Barry in particular. It's a really interesting project. I think the program, if it comes to fruition, will answer every question that you've asked. Um, my only question really is a very minimal one. And that is that you haven't included pesticides, agricultural pesticides. Is there a reason for that? Or is there a reason that they should perhaps be included? Most of them are not likely to be available, but are there any that you should look at? So that's my question. And thank you very much. Um, it looks like a magnificent, in fact, a Ferrari version of a monitoring program. Do you want to consolidate questions? So you want me to carry on? Okay. Um, just to echo Prof Day, I think this is a fascinating setup. I'm um, looking forward to it being implemented and, and answering a lot of very important questions. Also, um, on, on that point, um, I think it's a very valid point, um, particularly from um, certain, certain misuse of, of uh, pesticides and herbicides, particularly chemicals. Um, I think some of them, uh, particularly water-soluble ones like the glyphosates, would be an interesting uh, uh, parameter to, to include. Um, but the, the, the also very minor question that I had was just around the, um, the sampling points on the edge of the mixing zone and how you are um, incorporating environmental conditions and prevailing wind and oceanographic conditions into that. Are you, are you normalizing for that, that certain sites are going to be overexposed at a particular sampling time versus others? 
Um, and how are you doing that? One way would be, I guess, to average the, the sampling points that are concentric around there, but would you still make available the, the data from each sampling point? Because that still would be interesting. Thanks. Hi, Paul again. Um, my point uh, also relates a little bit to the point I made before. Uh, Camps Bay in particular, uh, you did mention CSR. I think in those days it was in or, uh, Rio. Um, I have never managed to actually get a definitive answer as to the design capacity of Camps Bay in particular, and I'd like that um, to possibly be given to this forum maybe to the, in between or at the next uh, meeting. But, but what, what relates to this presentation is that the design capacity of a pipeline um, obviously is uh, relates to the environment and the oceanographic uh, conditions that they assumed at the time. And so I, I would like to know that um, whether the assumptions that were made when the design of Camps Bay in particular was made, which was in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, whether that, that the oceanographic information that they used for the design is actually relevant in today's terms, and whether <clears throat> studies that you're going to do are based on those assumptions, because it could be that Camps Bay, and, and I think the public is really noticing that um, there is possibly effluent coming back onto the beaches in Camps Bay in particular, and I think that's where most of the public concern is um, around effluent back on the beaches. It's possible that the design wasn't done correctly in those days. And I would like that the study um, or this proposal actually has a look at what the initial criteria were for the dispersal um, area and whether that's actually happening today. Because we have had obviously 30, 40 years now of um, information and possibly things have changed. Uh, but we are concerned that the, um, let's call it the plume, isn't, isn't uh, um, behaving in, in possibly the way it was designed to. Thanks. Any responses? I'll take the first two and then uh, I'll ask Greg to, to, to comment on the third question. Your, your question, Jenny, about uh, polychlorinated biophenols. Sorry, your question was about pesticides and herbicides. Um, yes, we haven't specifically included those. We don't expect, or well, there shouldn't be too many, of pesticides in domestic effluent. Um, but that's not to say that they aren't there. Uh, certainly acknowledge that they will be there. Um, we have included uh, what are known as polychlorinated biophenols, which are, are chlorinated compounds, but um, don't necessarily extend to all pesticides. I, I think it is something that is worth potentially worth looking at, um, but we didn't include it here, basically for the cost effect, trying to uh, trying to maintain, trying to limit costs more than anything else. Uh, can I just comment? I think that I don't know about enough about the chemistry of glyphosate to know whether it's likely to, to be very persistent. But that's the one probably, as, as Phil mentioned, more than any of rather than a whole suite of them. Just to have a look at that might be a good thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that comment. I think we can certainly look at that. Um, your question on the normalizing for weather. Um, yes, our, our, our plan is to try and sample uh, at Across, across the months and uh, that we would randomly assign those dates in advance and basically do the sampling under whatever weather conditions are prevailing at the time. Obviously, first prize would be to sample every day and get every single weather condition, but our, our intention here is over a long enough period of time, we will ultimately capture all of those weather conditions. Um, the other part of that question is that we're going to be using our monitoring results to validate the results of the dispersion modeling work which was undertaken and which, which looked at 
all possible weather conditions, different temperature, different wind conditions, wave conditions, um, uh, a stratification in the water column, no stratification. So, yes, it's, it's difficult, it's just simply not possible to sample under all possible weather conditions, but we hope that by over a period of time we will collect the data we need to firstly calibrate and validate the models that modeling work that has been done, and then secondly to answer the questions around what impact different weather conditions have on a dispersion of the effluent and uh, specifically the, the, the susceptibility that sensitive receptors have to, to being, to being uh, smothered with effluent. Um, the second part of that question, you asked whether the data from all the sites would be available. Our intention is to make that data available. It, will, it needs to be submitted to the department with, as part of the permit conditions, so it certainly will be available with, with, the, with the annual and summary reports. Uh, but for many people, the summary information or the interpretive information is possibly more important. But yes, all of the data will be available. And uh, we're good to answer. Um, thanks. Very so, good. Greg, please, can I just interrupt you with a, with a follow on from that, that question, just on my point? Um, so, yes, the weather conditions are, are important, I, I guess, and over time you should you should average them out. What I, what I was trying to get at was what you were saying about the validating the models of dispersion. Um, is if you if the models are not uh, validated entirely, in other words, it shows a, 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 a predilection for the prune to be moving in a certain direction. That would be, is there is there a, a possibility of altering the experimental design or the monitoring design in order to incorporate any changes to that plume uh, monitoring if, if the if models are not validated? Uh, if I can just respond quickly, absolutely, that is the purpose of the monitoring program. It is an adaptive management plan. Um, one of the uh, permit conditions that Mike touched on earlier is that dispersion modeling needs to be done. Um, the, the, the requirement there is, is standard in all permits of this nature, and the modeling needs to be updated every five years, or every time, or every ten years, whenever the permit is issued. So if, if, the, if the results of the monitoring program suggest that the monitoring modeling was not valid or was incorrect in some way, that's the opportunity to update and refine those models to try and capture more accurately the, 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 uh, the impacts. So also answering Paul's question into that as well. So the, this monitoring program is being built on top of work that was done from 2020 to 2022 or 2019 to 2022. So, um, and that was the, uh, where the detailed dispersion modeling has been done. And that was using, Paul, to answer your question, real-time data, both in wave wind um, and wave action and wave direction and current direction, as well as accurate information on current flows out of the moon particles. So not predicted flows, but actual real-time current flows. The only thing that is added into that in terms of the real-time flows and pressures and the current wave conditions that were all collected and measured as part of that project uh, was, as I mentioned earlier, we used the standard scientific numbers of 10 to 7 and 10 to 6 for the bacterial counts in that dispersion model. The work we then continued through that period, which was, if I was asked Jeremy just to find a slide on the water quality sampling points for the Camps Bay one, which is one that you raised, is that we are continually doing exactly what you're asking for, and the work today shows that these points, these sites, although Jeremy and Barry have added to them, were determined based on the dispersion modeling, real-time dispersion modeling, for the point of validating what the plume and the dispersion modeling showed. And that was using real-time data, which is a collection of water quality sampling, both at the bottom, midwater, and surface water, over winter and summer for three years at both those locations over a six week period. That data is all available for you to have a look at. It's the CLS reports that are on the public website. And that essentially did exactly what you asked for, which was to say this first set of plume modeling, which is used real time now data, shows this is how we expect the plume to react in winter and summer under those different conditions. And then we went out and sampled those points to see whether the data aligned with what the plume does. The, what it's shown today so far is that that does align, is that the plume is operating and working operating on where the plume is dispersing in the way that um, the model is showing, and that's been supported by real-time data collected for water quality at those variables. And this is how those points were set for Camps Bay, Glen, Park Bay, and Greenpoint. And those reports are there for everyone to read. 
and then the work that will continue through this monitoring program will continue to build on that and sh keep verifying whether that is the case or not. So that's the point of partly what uh, Jeremy raised at the beginning is part of this is also we understand the stuff much better over long-term databases, collecting data in the same places over time so that we can see how that is working rather than snapshots. But essentially that is how the dispersion model was done by PRW. It's one of the best dispersion models that you can get. And then it was validated um, through the CLS work, which is the collection of real-time data to show whether that's the case or not. Um, and I would encourage everyone to read those. I know they are lengthy reports, but they, but they could have all the data in it. The sample points, the actual values for E. coli, intracocci, uh, temperature, salinity, etc. for all of those monitoring points. And that's for continuing that regard. Uh, a minor supplementary additional point from our chair, just to note that these maps are two-dimensional, but for water quality, the monitoring points are three depths. So it's at the surface, in the depth, and close to the bottom. In an attempt to capture what the modeling shows is a plume that obviously moves in three dimensions and that sometimes uh, extends uh, wider at the mid-depth than it does at the surface. Uh, so the intention would be to, to uh, capture those events. The other point is just to note the allowable mixing zone, which is a, it's a slightly crude instrument in the European guidelines, but the reason that it exists is so that you have a defined point at which you, uh, with the, the regulator, agree at which point you should be meeting standards and you continue to monitor at that point uh, whether the blue moves in your strong events in a different direction or not. Can I just um, ask on that point then, are, are you satisfied um, and can we explain to the public that somehow that? We are all satisfied that the, the modeling um, is showing what is actually the, the, the fact, and that we aren't affected. We somehow the um, news that people seem to have or see on, in reality isn't the case. Because you know we obviously experience in Camps Bay in particular um, a lot of people that believe that the marine art is on a lot of days. During the year, there seems to be some kind of back wash back onto the coast. So I don't know if the models show that, um, or, or not at all, or if they do, can we accept that it that it only happens three or four times a year during certain weather conditions? Um, how do we get that information out to the public, um, and are we satisfied? With it? So, I understand the query because I get, I get that query a lot myself. I mean, the, the only thing that we can speak to is the data that we collect. So, the, and, and that's the best that we can do. So, the, for camp space specifically, the models show, the dispersion modeling shows that the water quality guidelines, in fact, this, the modeling shows for all three sites, both camp space, both camp space, Greenpoint, and Heart Bay, that the dispersion modeling shows that for both intracocca and E. coli, you shouldn't really measure E. coli on seawater anyway, so if that, but it's for both, that due to the marine outfalls, or as a result of the marine outfalls, the natural water quality guidelines are not exceeded anywhere along the shoreline of Cape Town's coastline because of the marine outfalls. So that's what's the, the, the answer from the dispersion model. The data that we've collected and it comes back to particularly shows the same thing, that we don't see an increase in values because of the marine outfalls. And that, you know, there's a, and I've been part of those radio interviews and all those kinds of things where claims are made. So the, the only best way that I can say it is that, although people will, will argue with me, is that camp space retained new flag status. And everyone will say, well, it's only for a few months of the year, but it's actually for the, the monitoring itself of new flags over a six month period or so. Uh, it's retained that for over 17 years. It, 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 and that is independent analysis report. It couldn't do that if this outfall was reaching the shoreline in any meaningful kind of amount. It, it would not, those things can't happen at the same time. Um, we do see at times over a very long period of time in Camps Bay, there are, there are water quality sample that has a spike in it, but of course that spike up wouldn't answer that question. There be many, many things. But compared to all of the, the, the sites that we monitor on the shoreline, Camps Bay and Clifton exhibit extraordinarily good because of the water quality on the shoreline for recreation purposes. That doesn't mean to say there's never a a spike at some point, and I, and I said we can't always explain what the spikes are. It can be poor laboratory analysis, it could be somebody didn't pick up off the dog afterwards, it can be all sorts of things, and we can't explain what's causing them. But if you look over the last one, we have data that goes back to the 1980s from Camps Bay in terms of monitoring the shoreline. The monitoring of the shoreline of Camps Bay is that they meet very good water quality standards from a recreational point of view. 
that wouldn't be possible if the main outflow was reaching the shoreline in any meaningful effect. It, it, it can't be those and it can't go together. The, the water quality in other locations on our coastline doesn't show that same pattern. So that's the best answer that I can give you. And I really would encourage people to read the, the they're all on the website on the coastal water quality page. They're called the CLS Water Quality Monitoring Corp. Points. Those are three years worth of data, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, where you multiple and many, all of these points were sampled religiously at depth, midwater, and surface, and it shows the same outcome over and over again. So I know that's unlikely to convince many of the critics out there, but that's the answer that I can give you basically on the data. If it was reaching the shoreline in any meaningful way, we would see that in the data. We would see counts of entropocar being consistently high. And that's, over, that's not over a month or a week or six months, that's over many, many years of constant monitoring of camps by each, as well as the tide. So that's the best answer that I can give. So just on um, the point under effluent quality monitoring, uh, point three, point three, point two, the permit holder must install an automatic sample within three years from the date of issue of this permit. What are we intending to do about that? Is that an automatic sampler? What is that? What are we intending? It's that the pump station, I understand. So that's why I wanted to bring it up to another part. But, um, you know, because it, it also um, uh, re refers to the, the um, question that the man from Satori asked was, you know, where the monitoring is actually done weekly, and then let's say for um, suspended solids, it's 780 milligrams per litre. Does that mean you're taking one litre once a week out of, out of, out of, out of a quantity of, of um, 11,000 uh, cubic metres? You take one litre once a week. You know, so that sample is exceptionally tight compared to the quantity of, of effluent that's coming out there. So if you add this automatic sampler, does that help the system? And I think it probably should. And is that something that we're working towards? I can answer that. So the three automatic samples have been installed at all three of course. They take a composite sample of the week and then it's not a collab sample. They take a composite of the week and that weekly sample is then tested. Uh, or we must go visit. Yeah, uh, next week. Yeah. Uh, last question to talk today. Thank you for that. Um, Barry, the sampling program sounds really, really, really useful and thorough. It's, I wish you could have that kind of level of monitoring and a lot of other projects I'm involved in. But I do have a question around your reference sites, and that sort of segues into my other question. Your site at Chapman's Peak, I would just be concerned that its proximity to the Hunt Bay River potentially makes that more problematic than my others and it's maybe something you can comment on and um, certainly on the map that looks very close. But that does link to a concern I raised previously um, when Greg really presented the, the program a few months ago. And it's really around the fact that a monitoring program that is not really of any value unless it contributes to decision making. And one of the kinds of decisions that are going to be made in the next few years by the city is how to spend their money on which of the major national treatment works. And I'm concerned that by focusing this level of study just on marine art force, we potentially run the risk of overemphasizing the effects of these five percent while the remaining 95% of the sites have far greater impacts on our marine systems. And I would really like to recommend that you, I would have expanding this work, that you add at least one additional site that specifically looks at the art 
outside one of our major wastewater groups. So somewhere outside Wollington Lagoon, or Zeke Flay, or Hester River would be potential sites. Thank you. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the primary source of pollution on our coastal environment is more land based related issues versus the outfalls. And I think you're 100% right. I think we run the danger of focusing on these three things and ignoring uh, a much bigger challenge in our city. So if the difficulty for us is, is resources and capacity to expand this kind of monitoring program. So obviously, our intention and desire from coastal management point of view is certainly to do exactly that is to, to build on this and expand it. There is work that Jeremy and Barry is helping us with around exactly that at the moment, which we'll bring to the Section 80 committee in, in the next couple of months, where there are further three sites that we want to expand this monitoring program to, and we'll talk to that as well, but I think your, your point is 100% right, and I think this work needs to be extended across all of those other sites as we can. Uh, but the, as uh, both my colleagues have pointed out, one of the real challenges that we face is this kind of work is very, very extensive. So there's also, um, as in government, there's the hard decisions to be made where you can spend a lot of money on monitoring or you can spend that same amount of money potentially fixing or managing these environments and those are hard choices that you have to make. So all of the time there's this kind of awful balance of having to make choices around how much money do we spend and how do we grow this kind of knowledge. And I think uh, the key for us around this is we're trying to build partnerships with our colleagues from Sandbox who are doing all sorts of biodiversity monitoring in the NPA to see whether there are changes uh, that are happening in other parts of our coastline and whether those could be associated with uh, the waste pollution sources that we can have. So I agree with you 100%. We, we will bring the, the expanded version of the monitoring plan to the Section 80 committee, which covers most of your concerns and will be there at the next meeting. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, oh. <clears throat> Sorry, I was just going to respond to the other part of uh, Liz's question around why Chapman's Peak. Um, it is a historic reference site. I, I do share your concerns. It is, clo it is closer to the Hart Bay Powerful and the and the Hart Bay River than any of the other other sites. But it is a historic reference site, and uh, we wanted to bring that into the monitoring program. We will evaluate it over time, and if it does, if it does prove problematic in as much as the results there are very different to the other reference sites, we will seek to move it elsewhere. But currently, the main reason was it's, it's it has been used historically as a reference site, and we're hoping to maintain that continuity. Okay. Thank you for thank you to everyone who has patiently sat through the last uh, almost three hours. Uh, it must be incredibly disciplined, and I can say to the members of the public that uh, if this was a council meeting, then all the politicians would have been at lunch already. So I really do appreciate the level of engagement that we've had in this room. Uh, to the members of the public that are here today, I think that, I hope that you see the importance of hosting a forum like this, and in turn you can see the level of engagement from these independent experts and activists over here, uh, and the scientific oversight which they conduct. And again, thank you so much to the uh, Section 80 committee members here today. And it would be, I would be remiss to not thank uh, Mr. Paul Moxley specifically today, who went from uh, perhaps having sitting in the crowd with the members of the public to making such an impression that uh, I felt very obliged to invite him to formally be part of, uh, of the Section 80 Water Advisory Committee as our consulting engineer. Uh, and you, Mr. Moxley, uh, should uh, feel uh, immensely satisfied today because uh, you're very much on the person that started the process uh, that got us to this point in hosting the permanent advisory forum today. So my uh, heartfelt thanks go out to you today. I would like to say that you, you won't find a forum like this anywhere else in local government in South Africa. And it's been a long morning. 
for the first permanent advisory forum meeting in the city of Cape Town. But again, the work and the engagements are setting a really important precedent uh, that can be learned by other governments around the country. So we are out of time, and in that regard, what we will be doing is that all of the guests that have attended here today, we will email these full presentations to you. Uh, if you if it's if you've been if you are or uh, confirm your attendance, uh, and then what we will be allowing is in that email will also state quite clearly that we will be requesting any further written comments uh, that will form part of the minutes the minutes of this meeting. So if there's anything that you feel you want to clarify or is being uh, unsaid at this point in time, then uh, then there's a further opportunity, uh, we've, got, we've got seven days to do that, uh, and we would really appreciate any additional uh, participation uh, once you've looked through these presentations and reports in your own time. That brings us to the end of the first permanent advisory forum meeting today. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who has. Uh, attended uh, this meeting and you will be, be receiving the, you will be on our mailing list for the second permanent advisory forum in a quarter's time. Uh, an additional notice, we, for the committee members here, the section 80 committee members, we are not correct. Um, we don't have enough councillors here. So that means that we, uh, it will be futile for us to host the second part of this meeting. So, we uh, this, this closes all business for the day. Uh, I would however like to chat to all of you and uh, Councillor Bowden as well for five minutes after the meeting. Uh, I think we are officially closed. Thank you everyone for your participation.